Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Good morning. Ms Hogan-Doran, are we ready to proceed? Uh, yes, Commissioners. Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, first today, may I say something for the assistance of the parties in relation to the future work plan of the Royal Commission? Please. We note that the production of materials has been substantially delayed and is still ongoing. Uh, by way of update, Chair, since the Friday before the first public hearings, uh, a further 3,162 documents and responses have been produced to the Commission, comprising around 44,000 pages of new material, as well as consolidated responses from the State of Victoria, State of New South Wales and the State of Queensland. The Council Assisting Team has instructed that the State of Queensland completed responding to notices on 22 May, most of the responses being received between 21 April and 8 May. The State of New South Wales completed responding to notices on 28 May, most responses having been received between 24 April and 28 May. The State of South Australia completed responding to notices on 20 May, most of the responses were received between 28 April and 20 May. The State of Western Australia has substantially responded to notices. Most of their responses were received between 24 April and 1 June. The State of Victoria has not yet completed but has substantially responded to notices with further tranches of documents anticipated, most of the responses having been received between 24 April and 1 June. The State of Tasmania has expressed to the Commission that due to the pressures of COVID-19, it is not in a position to respond to official requests by the Royal Commission. It has indicated, however, that it will provide the Commission with a submission containing its response to the terms of reference. The Commission's counsel and solicitor assisting teams are currently reviewing the additional material which has been provided. Unfortunately, this delay, together with the practical limitations due to the COVID-19 restrictions, has meant we have not been able, in this first hearing block, to examine all of the topics initially identified during the ceremonial hearing. We are, and we will have to, restructure the public hearings to accommodate these delays, and we have had to further limit the topics that are examined in this first hearing phase. <coughs> May I say something in respect of proposed hearing dates? It is now proposed that three hearing days be timetabled for 16 to 18 June. These will include panels on the topics of management of fuel loads, including prescribed burning, Indigenous land management and mechanical hazard reduction. <coughs> the week commencing 22 June for three days will concern matters raised by the terms of reference relevant particularly to local government. The fortnight commencing 29 June will be matters raised by the terms of reference relevant particularly to state and territory governments as well as several dates going over into the week commencing 13 July for matters concerning the Commonwealth Government. During this hearing, we hope to also canvass the remaining topics that have been deferred from this hearing block. It is to be recalled that topics for the later phase of hearings were identified in my address at the ceremonial hearing on 16 April. Further details of additional topics will be communicated next week to relevant parties for the purposes of their giving assistance to the Royal Commission in the preparation of witness statements and responses to further notice to give information. It is also expected that witness lists will be published in full in the week prior to the relevant hearing block. And as previously notified, issues papers and background papers will continue to be published inviting comment on discrete issues. We also expect the public submissions, numbering something in the order of 1,700, um, and which include a substantial number of recommendations for consideration, will be published in the coming week. I withdraw that next week. Uh, commissioners, as you know, the date for public submissions was extended to 28 April. Subsequently, requests have been received from two states to make opening submissions. In addition to the submissions, they may otherwise make in response to the issues papers that have been and will be published by the Commission. One state has provided a submission overnight. The Council Assisting Team position is that the Commissioners should receive any submissions that they think would be of assistance. At a time of convenience to the Commissioners, 
together with all relevant documentation supporting such submissions, so that the Commissioners may evaluate those submissions in an efficient way. We do not think it is necessary that parties provide an opening submission, and we do not propose that any direction be given for parties with leave to appear, or other parties, that they must do so. We remain, as always, mindful of the tight time frame in which, Commissioners, you must deliver your report. To that end, we propose to canvass with parties with leave to appear an opportunity to provide a short oral opening submission for the assistance of the Commission in the later hearing blocks. May I now say something about witnesses? We note that the solicitors assisting the Commission wrote to all states and territories, not just those presently with leave to appear, requesting them, that is on the 21st of May, requesting them to identify, first, key state-level witnesses who can speak to overall emergency planning, management, coordination and response. <clears throat> Second, witnesses with specific experience relevant to the Commission's terms of reference. And third, witnesses with specific operational experience in relation to matters that may be the subject of interest from the Commission as potential case studies. Upon receipt of that information, the Commission staff and those assisting you will be in a position to work with state parties and state and territory parties to finalise the identity of any witnesses that might be called and to prepare a statement. Commissioners, we are instructed that to date the Commission has received responses from the State of Victoria and the State of Queensland that identify key witnesses and we look forward to the further assistance of those and other states and territories by the end of this week. May I say something now in respect of technology? Commissioners, council assisting are concerned to facilitate the ability of parties with leave to appear to engage with the Commission where appropriate during the hearings, particularly for occasions which may give rise to a need to protect information from disclosure, such as an occasion to object to a line of questioning due to concerns that the answers would disclose or tend to disclose matters that are probably properly subject to public interest immunity. To that end, we have made inquiries in relation to enhancing the capacity of the video conference facilities that are being used to support these online hearings. On Friday, audiovisual enhancements were identified to parties with leave to appear, enabling parties to have a direct audio and video feed to supplement their access to the real-time transcript. The solicitors assisting and commission staff are continuing to explore the ways in which the technology presently utilised may be enhanced and we will report back to you as soon as we are able today with a view to the Commission holding a procedural hearing at 9am tomorrow to test those facilities. That's all I wish to say in respect of those matters. Thanks, Ms Hogan. The, the Commission has been cognizant of the COVID-19 uh, measures that are in place and uh, we've taken that into account when we're looking at uh, getting the information. I think we've been quite accommodating whilst also maintaining a high level of transparency uh, but I do encourage all the parties that we're working with uh, cooperatively to provide information in a timely manner so that we can get on with our business. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner, today um, the Commission is proposing to commence its exploration of the Commonwealth's responsibilities in relation to natural disaster arrangements and national coordination of firefighting and emergency services, and in particular aerial firefighting. Uh, this morning you will hear evidence from Mr Stuart Ellis. Mr Ellis is the CEO of the Australasian Fire and Emergency Service Authorities Council Limited, or AFAC as we will call it, and as it is more commonly known. AFAC is a not-for-profit company whose members are Australian and New Zealand firefighting and emergency services, as well as some Commonwealth entities. Its business units include the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience, the National Resource Sharing Centre and the National Aerial Firefighting Centre. I anticipate that Mr Ellis's evidence will explain the role of AFAC, its various initiatives and programs, and its role in assisting coordination and resource sharing between the states and territories and, the, and information with the Commonwealth. May I say we expect to hear more from AFAC in our subsequent hearing blocks. We will then hear from Mr Richard Alder, the General Manager of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, or NAFSI. I anticipate that Mr Alder's evidence will explore the role aerial firefighting and the role of NAFSI has in procuring aerial assets on behalf of the states and territories. 
This afternoon, we anticipate we will call five witnesses in relation to aerial firefighting. The witness list anticipated that those five witnesses would be called as a panel. However, I'm antici um, anticipating modifying that slightly. I will first call Ruth Ryan, the corporate fire manager of HVB Plantations, which is the largest non-governmental land manager and manager of forest plantation resources in Victoria. I expect then to call a panel of three from the aerial firefighting industry. Philip Hurst is the CEO of the Aerial Application Association of Australia, also known as the 4As, which is the national industry body representing Australia's aerial firefighting operators and pilots. Mr John McDermott is the president of McDermott Aviation, the largest privately owned helicopter operator in Australia. And Mr Raymond Cronin is the managing director of Kestrel Aviation, which provides aerial assets for emergency response and firefighting support. Through this panel, we will hear the industry perspective on aerial firefighting and the NAFC arrangements. Finally, this afternoon, I will call Dr. Rhys Clothier, the president of the Australian Association for Unmanned Systems, Australia's largest industry association, the drone industry, for the drone industry. We will hear from him in relation to the potential uses of of drone technology in firefighting operations and regulatory issues. Two other matters I will proposing to take the commission, you two commissioners, is a report of the Australian Transport Safety Bureau in relation to incidents um, in relation to aerial firefighting and also the Civil Aviation Safety Authority's response to our notice to give. I'll take you to those um, in between Mr Ellis and Mr Alder's evidence. Just excuse me one moment. Commissioners, if it is convenient, I propose to tender, and then I will call Mr Ellis, tender the material in document bundle 4.1, uh, as notified to parties, which is the includes the response to the notice to give information, um, which was dated 25 May 2020 from the Australasian Fire and Emergency Service Authorities Council Limited, uh, and the various annexures to that statement, uh, that response I should say, uh, as well as a further notice to give information. I'll just have that checked, um, Commissioners. I think those those dates are in error because they're both identified as being on 25 May, whereas one of them is a second response, I think. Um, also included is the submission of the Australasian Fire and Emergency Service Authorities Council and some supporting documentation that has been provided um, by, um, by AFAC um, during the course of their dealings and assistance that they have been giving to the Royal Commission. All those materials were provided uh, to parties with leave uh, prior to today. So that would be uh, documents numbered 4.1.1 through to 4.1.42. Chair. So those documents will be received as exhibits as marked. I call Stuart Ellis. Mr Ellis, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Thanks for joining us. Ms Hogan Doran. Uh, Mr Ellis, I understand you'll take an affirmation. Yes, thank you. Mr Ellis, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr Ellis, uh, could you tell the commissioners what your role is in relation to the Australasian, I'll, I'll call it AFAC if I may, um, in relation to AFAC? Um, I'm the Chief Executive Officer, have been since uh, November 2012. The, um, 
Mr Ellis, I noticed that there's a very short delay between um, you speaking, us seeing you speak, and your words. So um, please excuse me if I speak over the top of you at any time. And I'll take it. Uh, we'll, we'll see how we go with the video conference facilities. Um, AFAC, uh, um, if you... Sorry, I'll start there. AFAC is a company limited by guarantee uh, and a registered charity. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. It certainly meets the legal definition of a charity as assessed by the ATO. And uh, um, it's a company that has as its membership some 31 uh, national, state and territory and New Zealand uh, organisations. Is that correct? Yes, fire agencies and state emergency services. And I understand that the background to the formation of this organisation is that um, um, in the period prior to 1994, uh, there was some coming together of the urban and rural uh, fire and emergency services. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. There were two associations re representing urban fire agencies and rural fire agencies, and they came together in 1994 to form AFAC. And is it right to say that initially AFAC was principally a peak body of those organisations? That is, it didn't have any operational functions in the actual... Um, uh, uh, is that right? That, that's correct. It really started as an, as an association and evolved to a peak body, and now is a national council, I, I would say, with operationally enabling responsibilities rather than operational responsibilities. I see. Now, New Zealand has a role in this organisation. In what way is that the case? Well, New Zealand uh, has has been a member of AFAC for a considerable period of time, and uh, similar to uh, policing, it's it's seen as an integral member, um, and hence we are Australasian rather than Australian. So, from from an AFAC perspective, New Zealand is an equal member with all the other Australian um, fire and emergency agencies. And, and what role does the Commonwealth have within the agency, or within the organisation, I should say? Look, the Commonwealth is, is a member of AFAC. Um, they don't have any role specifically, but they attend the National Council meetings. Um, the Director General of EMA co-chairs the Commissioner and Chief Officers Strategic Committee, which is a subcommittee, of the AFAC board, um, and we are in very regular contact with uh, Emergency Management Australia. I understand uh, Air Services Australia and Parks Australia are also Commonwealth bodies that are members of AFAC, is that right? That is correct, and it, it really uh, reflects that AFAC membership is all public sector fire and emergency agencies, and those two Commonwealth agencies um, I guess effectively with EMA, are, are also um, members of AFAC. Uh, so it's constituted by public sector agencies, but it's not itself a public sector body, is that right? That's correct. It's, it is, as you said, a, a not-for-profit company limited by guarantee. <coughs> and it's really, it, it's, it's a collective of those agencies and the best framework um, identified when it was formed was to form a not-for-profit company. There's also, it has affiliate membership, I understand. It does. These um, include other agencies that aren't fire and emergency agencies, such as uh, the Bureau of Meteorology um, or Geoscience Australia, mm -hmm. but also includes um, some uh, private agencies, such as private forestry agencies. Those affiliate members don't have voting rights, but they can participate in AFAC activities and AFAC collaboration groups. I think I understand also that the Australian Red Cross is an affiliate member, is that right? That is correct. And what role does the Australian Red Cross play in AFAC? The um, Australian Red Cross is a partner in one of those business units you referred to which is the Australian Institute of Disaster Resilience. And so um, Red Cross participate in a number of those collaboration groups I mentioned, um, but also 
is a partner in the consortium, which is the Australian Institute of Disaster Resilience, which is managed by AFAC. So you've just mentioned the business units. Um, you have there are four business units. Is that right? That's that's right. It's that's the National Resource Sharing Centre, mm -hmm. which delivers coordination of interstate and international resource deployments. The National Aerial Firefighting Centre, or NAFSI, which delivers national arrangements for the provision of aerial firefighting resources. Uh, the Australian Institute of Disaster Resilience, uh, which is a consortium with the um, Department of Home Affairs, AFAC, Australian Red Cross, and the Bushfire Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre, but it's managed by, by AFAC and the Emergency Management Professionalisation Scheme, which is a credentialing scheme established by AFAC um, to confirm individual practitioner qualifications, um, experience and currency. I think in an earlier version or in, in, in one um, part of the submissions or responses that have been provided by APAC, AFAC, there's also been reference to the Centre of Excellence for Prescribed Burning. What, what, where does that now sit within this AFAC structure? So the Centre of Excellence uh, now sits within the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience mm -hmm. because it's been identified essentially as um, an activity of resilience by conducting planned or prescribed burning. And so that has become um, an element of ADA or the, or the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience. Um, you mentioned before that EMA, um, EMA has a role in relation to co-chairing the uh, commissioners and chief officers st strategic committee, is that right? That's correct. We, we refer to it as COSC, COSC. for brevity. The, um, Sorry. The, does the EMA have a role in any other aspect or any, other, any of the other business units that you described? Well, it, it, EMA funds um, ADA and so uh, there is a contract between EMA and AFAC to deliver services on um, through through ADA, so there's a governing um, committee um, for ADA, and that's made up of um, representatives from EMA and AFAC. So uh, they have a role with with ADA as well as um, co-chairing the Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee. Uh and where does, and you, you said before that EMA has the role in relation to <clears throat> COSC, did you say it was COSC, COSCI? Yes, yep. COSC. COSC. The, um, uh, so, I beg your pardon. Sorry, so, so when we established COSC, um, AFAC established COSC in 2012, it's, it's a jurisdictional representative representation of the fire and emergency services because we found the 31 members is, is too large to bring together when we have uh, um, emergency incidents or or responses or indeed um, uh, strategic issues we need to address um, and we proposed at the time that EMA the director general of EMA co-chair that cost committee with a representative of the states and territories and the state and territory representative um, rotates each year and the director general EMA r remains as uh, an ongoing co-chair. What's the relationship today between COSC and the National Resource Sharing Centre? Is it one and the same or are they yeah, sorry, there's just a little break up there. So, so the National Resource Sharing Centre um, actions or, or, or delivers on the decision of COSC. I see. So, um, if we take a situation over this last summer, um, COSC made uh, a range of decisions regarding resource sharing, and they are actioned by the National Resource 
sharing centres. So they facilitate the actual resource sharing. All right. I'm going to come back uh, in a moment to some more questions about how that uh, research centre and cost decision making works, um, and in particular in relation to the experience of the 2019-2020 bushfire season. But just before I pass from all the sort of organisational questions, so I have so the commissioners can have a clear picture in relation to um, how uh, AFAC um, is constituted. I understand there's also three companies um, within the AFAC structure. Is that right? If, could, if you could just identify those to the commissioners. Yes, so the three companies. That there's AFAC Limited itself. Um, there is a conference company, because uh, which is a partnership between AFAC um, and a exhibition company, and there is a third company referred to as um, as the Fire Predictive Services, which manages the Phoenix Rapid Fire Simulation Software, which. Um, helps predict fire spread. And is that is that a project, just on that one, is that a project um, uh, in collaboration with or, or somehow connected with the CSIRO's SPARC uh, research project? Uh, well, it, it certainly um, is, is positioned to do that. I see. And uh, just, just, just recently, um, the board of that company and indeed the AFAC National Council made a decision to collaborate with the CSIRO to develop SPARC as effectively the next generation of um, fire simulation. And so that's work in progress, if you like, but that's certainly how we are orientated. Um, just, one, just one moment, please, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioners, just by way of assistance, I understand CSIRO will be caught, being called on Thursday in relation to that topic. Okay, thanks. Um, now, we can return to... <coughs> I want to ask you some questions now about the National Resource uh, Centre arrangements and, and how that how that has assisted um, the coordination on a national level uh, of uh, responses to uh, natural disasters and in particular, um, and more recently, bushfires. Um, the AFAC maintains the Australasian arrangement for interstate assistance, uh, and I understand from your submission, facilitates resource sharing under this agreement through the centre. Is that a fair characterisation? Yes, it is. All right. And the jurisdictions in, can engage, the jurisdictions by which I mean state and territories and New Zealand, can engage in resource sharing through that interstate assistance arrangement, or they can proceed by way of bilateral mutual aid arrangements. Is that, that the way that web of arrangements um, operate? It is. The, the, bi the bilateral mutual aid is something that, that we are now discussing discouraging because they're wanting to maintain a, a national a national picture or national situational awareness and by maintaining or developing bilateral arrangements it makes it very difficult to do that so um, wherever possible we're encouraging jurisdictions to conduct resource sharing apart from what we would refer to as cross-border operations which are localized arrangements where resources may cross the border by 20 kilometres or 50 kilometres, for instance, to assist um, on an immediate emergency or, or a specific incident. Apart from those localised arrangements, um, we're encouraging all resource sharing to be conducted through the National Resource Sharing Centre. And when you talk about resources and resources being shared, what, what are the resources that you're speaking of? It, it has been um, personnel. It, it is when we refer to strike teams, which are a, a combination of, of personnel and firefighting vehicles. It includes those as well. And uh, following this, this season at the um, April meeting of the Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee, it was agreed that it would also include 
um, the resource sharing of um, aviation assets. So that the National Resource Sharing Centre would would be responsible for monitoring and facilitating the resource sharing of ground and air resources. So to the extent the ground resources have been shared, that's um, that that's career and volunteer personnel of the fire Correct. emergency services? I see. It um, is indeed, yes. We'll come back to it in a little more detail, but um, the decision in April to include uh, the sharing of air assets, how were air assets shared in up until this decision was made? Look, that 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 was conducted more on a what we were referring to before a bilateral arrangement. So um, the, the the decision to conduct resource sharing is the responsibility of each commissioner and chief office. They have legislative responsibility um, about uh, permitting resources from their jurisdiction to pass to another jurisdiction. But we've found that conducting those discussions in that Commissioner and Chief Officer Strategic Committee environment um, ensures that everyone is kept aware, including Emergency Management Australia, and maintains that national situational awareness. And um, I understand the resource sharing, you've talked about bilateral arrangements. Are there also subgroups or hubs within the National Resource Sharing Centre so that some states and some territories are sharing within a, a, a northern and a southern hub? For, um, for international arrangements. I see. Because the, the National Resource Sharing Centre um, is, is really looking at things, as the name says, from a national perspective. The, the detailed logistics and movement and uh, it, it is maintained by the jurisdictions. And when we deploy overseas, we've put arrangements in place where we have established, in fact, three hubs. Now, one centred on uh, New South Wales uh, Rural Fire Service, one centred on Emergency Management Victoria, and one centred on New Zealand. The, the New South Wales hub um, becomes responsible for identifying resources from New South Wales, ACT, Queensland and the Northern Territory. The Victorian hub becomes uh, responsible for identifying resources from Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia and Western Australia. And the New Zealand hub looks after resources from New Zealand. So it just ensures that, that at, a, at a state or territory level, or indeed New Zealand, they have the, the um, local arrangements, um, the local communications with families and so on when people are, are overseas, um, and it's uh, arranged in that manner. Uh, there's a few things I want to um, take up with you in relation to um, that helpful explanation of the way those um, matters are arranged. So you've spoken about bilateral arrangements and now you've spoken about three hubs which I might call regional arrangements. Um, but you also spoke about the concept of a national perspective. H how is a national perspective um, arrived at through these, through this bilateral, regional, and 31-member approach? Well, as I said earlier, we um, discourage the bilateral arrangements um, at this stage, and it, it, we're in a maturity continuum. We have gone from you know, 10 years ago where all resource sharing was done bilaterally. One, one commissioner or chief officer would ring another and ask if they have available resources. Now that all occurs within the environment of the Commissioner and Chief Officer Strategic Committee. Uh, but when, when a particular jurisdiction asks for additional resources, the National Resource Sharing Centre then um, goes to the various states and territories and requests um, what availability there is in those different states and territories. We, we need to differentiate domestic resource sharing from international resource sharing. Yes. Those hubs play a role for international resource sharing I see. when we deploy resources overseas. Otherwise, 
each state and territory responds directly to the National Resource Sharing Centre and it acts effectively as a funnel. It, it identifies where resources are available and it funnels them to the requesting jurisdiction so that their responsibilities are only where do they deploy those resources, not where do they come from. So <clears throat> in relation to identifying a national perspective, um, uh, how, are, how, are, how is the challenge, assuming there is such, the challenge of prioritising resources being shared between particular states and territories? How, how are those decisions um, taken? Well, it's um, it, because of the AFAC collective as it is and the fact that we meet regularly during the year, it is a particularly collaborative environment. Um, we have 34 collaboration groups, which involve over 800 senior personnel from the different agencies, which meet throughout the year. Um, so it already is, is a very cooperative environment. Um, largely, we are able to identify the priorities um, collaboratively and put those in place. Um, Emergency Management Australia did Sorry. Yes, so I, was, I was just going to ask you in relation to that. So, as I understand it, um, in the lead up to last year's fire season, the Department of Home Affairs through Emergency Management Australia proposed a guidance note on national resource prioritisation. Um, and I might just have the commissioners um, that's behind tab 20, could, AFC.502.001.0971. Be brought up, operator. Now, Mr. Ellis, that document's being shown. Is that? Uh, can you see that on your screen? All right. Yes, I can. Um, I think I anticipated you. I think you just were just about to start to tell me about this uh, this document, just to speed things along. Uh, now, um, this document uh, is presently marked. Well, the version that we have here is marked discussion draft. I understand. Um, that a final version of this was adopted at some point. Is that correct? It, it, it has been. It, it's, um, so this is effectively policy guidance, if you like, and because it is policy guidance, it went to the Australian New Zealand Emergency Management um, Committee and ZEMPSI, and also to the Ministerial Council for Police and Emergency Management. I understand it was um, endorsed by by those committees late last year. This this was a initiative discussed at the Commission and Chief Chief Officer Strategic Committee last last year, early last year. Mm -hmm. um, EMA undertook to develop the document. They did so during the course of the year. Um, it was presented to Commissioners and Chief Officers late in the year. Um, and that's why it was uh, stamped a discussion draft at the time, I see. because it hadn't received the endorsement from um, the Ministerial Council and the Australian New Zealand Emergency Management Committee, which has since received that endorsement. All right. Um, the, what was the position prior to this document, this guidance note, um, in relation to national resource prioritisation? Um, well, there wasn't specific guidance. I mean, AFAC has a um, community safety position which, which, which highlights um, the priority for um, protection of human life. And indeed, the, 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 the common theme through the mission of all fire and emergency services is protection of life, property and the environment. In, in in that priority order, if you like. Um, so that's a decision which commissioners and chief officers are responsible for within their jurisdiction um, on an ongoing basis. And uh, this this formalised that thinking, if you like. All right. uh, on page on page three, I think is the actual. Yes, could we um, operate? Operate. Can I just ask one? I just may have missed it. If I can just ask one quick question, this this is um, this this document has recommendations 
at the back, and I think you say, I, I, I couldn't see a date on it. So can you tell me, you, I think you said those recommendations have now been adopted. Is that right? Look, that's, that's my understanding. I, I think that question needs to be directed to Emergency Management Australia because it's their, it's their document. But certainly the Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee has endorsed this, this document. When, could you elevated. tell me when? Because, sorry, could you tell me when the um, within AFAC this was a, this was endorsed? A date? It was in. It was endorsed in a interim capacity. Um, I, look, I, I'd, I'd have to take it on notice, but it would be my recollection is November of uh, two thousand and nineteen. Has it been applied? Um, well, it, it was effectively applied over the summer be, be, because the, the Commissioners and Chief Officers um, were presented with this document at that time. So, to your knowledge, so it, it, sorry, I was going to say, to your knowledge, these recommendations were adopted and applied in the last bushfire season. Let me just, excuse me, just reading the recommendations. Yeah. Yes, I would certainly say, Commissioner, that, that effectively um, those priorities listed were applied during the 2019-20 bushfire season. OK, I might leave it at the moment and see where that goes, because it, it, bearing in mind these, the, the form of these recommendations are work to the proposed arrangements and further development and finalisation of guidelines, I'd be interested to know actually what happened, if I can put it that way. But I'll leave it to Council Assisting and see how I go and um, come back to it if I need to. Thank you very much. Um, to, your, to assist you, Mr Ellis, um, I might take you back to page three, which is um, 0973, and to the heading interim arrangements in that first paragraph, um, because as uh, Commissioner Bennett's just pointed to, which was work to the proposed interim arrangements, so I'm just taking you back to the interim arrangements in fairness to you. Um, so this is what EMA proposed that the following interim guidance be adopted by Commonwealth, State and Territory agencies for the 2019-2020 severe weather season and propose that the interim arrangements be used until the national policy development and implementation work on planning and preparing for catastrophic disasters, which includes the development of national guidelines for resource prioritisation, is, fi is finalised. Um, if we could just go down to the, uh, under the heading prioritisation criteria. Thank you. Now, Mr Ellis, prioritisation criteria, that first one is protection of human life. That primacy of, um, of, the, of the, or the paramountcy of that being um, a, a matter that is informed at all jurisdictional levels within Australia's emergency uh, and disaster management legislation and policy. Is that consistent with your understanding? It is, and indeed it was um, a priority that was highlighted in the Victorian Bushfire Royal Commission mm -hmm. um, 2009-10 and is reflected in our strategic directions document, which is um, essentially the, the overall priorities for the sector. Um, Mr. Mr. Ellis, I'm going to come back to the Victorian Royal, uh, Victorian Bushfires Royal Commission, and also the strategic document in just one moment. We'll just finish on this document. Um, the prioritisation criteria uh, includes um, seven other matters. Um, did you do you do you do you know whether there was any debate or um, uh, or was there? Um, I'll, I'll start that again. Um, is that prioritisation criteria reflected in any other jurisdictional legislation or policy? Look, not not to my not to my knowledge. I see. So not, not not in that degree of specificity. So uh, this, as I said, it it was um, developed by Emergency Management Australia. They, they certainly they consulted with with AFAC, and I, I suspect um, 
other entities in the development of this of this document. So I think I think the confusion around the recommendations and the interim arrangements, the document we have, AFAC has, is what was presented to AFAC in in November two thousand and nineteen. My understanding is this this document has since been finalised. Um, but to my knowledge, AFAC doesn't actually have a copy. That's why we haven't included it in our I see. Um, submission no. or a response. Um, if I could just go over to the next page. Uh, actually, before I go back, before I do that, Mr. Mr. Ellis, in fairness to you, is there anything else you wanted to comment in relation to those prioritisation criteria or the priority order? Just before I go no, to the next page. No, no, I'm... I'm Thank you. All right. Just to the next page, um, the the uh, context of the decisions made using the arrangements is to take into account it's proposed these following matters, that the resources or capabilities held by commercial, private or the non-government sector be considered have been considered uh, and that the existing disaster management governance arrangement at jurisdictional, interjurisdictional, national and international levels will be used to assess, determine and agree on priority allocation when required. Now, just in relation to those, those two matters, um, the resource sharing that is done by the National Resource Sharing Centre, is that limited to uh, public sector agency resources or does it include commercial, private and non-government sector resources? No, it, it is just limited to government resources. I see. And in relation to the proposal that going forward, the resource sharing centre will also include um, aerial assets, will that also only be restricted to government aerial, government owned or leased or operated aerial assets, or will it also include uh, commercial, private or non-government sector aerial assets? Well, that will include um, commercial assets because the vast, ma the vast majority of the air assets used in aerial firefighting are, are contracted. So um, a small number are owned by government, a very small number, but the vast majority are, are contracted over the season, so they are commercial assets. But what we're referring to are, are those aerial assets that are contracted through the National Aerial Firefighting Centre. All right. Um, and just on the on the last uh, heading point, national coordination, uh, the proposal there was that where national coordination for a severe to catastrophic disaster is required and agreed, EMA, that is Emergency Management Australia, will lead the coordination effort in accordance with the... Now, what is uh, AGCMF, the Australian Government Crisis Management Framework? Is that how you understand that yes, acronym? Yes, and work directly with it state is. and territory governments in accordance with their respective emergency management systems. Um, in relation to that proposition of national coordination um, in severe to catastrophic disaster, uh, do you understand whether or not the severe to catastrophic disaster is a concept linked to COMDIS plan, that is the, the Commonwealth's disaster plan? Or is it a more well, recent I term? My my understanding of severe to catastrophic refers to severe to catastrophic fire danger ratings in the current ratings arrangements. Oh, I see. Um, so severe, extreme, and catastrophic and catastrophic are the highest fire danger rating. Oh, I, um, I I couldn't comment on whether they refer to um, the. Com plan or not, that would be a question for EMA. Right. Um, so, based on that, it is your understanding that it's related to the fire danger warnings and the fire danger warning systems. Um, catastrophic in uh, states other than Victoria is, is known as catastrophic, but in Victoria is known as um, ha has a different different uh, designation. Is that right? It does. it does. Victoria refers to it as code red. Code Red, and Code Red uh, was a warning uh, level that w came out of the recommendations of the Victorian Bushfires Royal Commission. Is that right? 
No, I don't think it is. So it's, in the, in, I think the, in the, the Victoria, after after that commission, I should say. Um, well, it was a decision made by Victoria to um, um, choose that particular terminology. Every other state and territory at the time chose the terminology catastrophic. I see. I don't want to trouble you on that. I just wanted to be clear that, as you understood it, catastrophic would inc include the the relevant the the, uh, the warning level of code red in in Victoria. That was all. Correct. Correct. I mean, it, it, it could be interpreted that, that those those two phrases are just there on their face value, okay. um, but we commonly refer to severe to catastrophic because that encompasses the three highest levels of our current fire danger rating system. All right. um, and on the understanding that the, uh, the, there were a number of occasions during the uh, last bush 29-2020 bushfire season where the fire danger rating index was severe to catastrophic at different times, um, do you understand, and on the understanding that this document was adopted by the relevant uh, strategic committees and EMA, uh, um, do you know whether or not EMA uh, led the coordination effort in the way that well, I think if it, well, my my awareness um, is I'm I'm not engaged with the national um, crisis considerations, um, which may have been in play, but from a um, fire and emergency perspective, um, they were certainly um, engaged with that by chairing the Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee. I see. I see. Um, there may have been other, other engagement, but AFAC wasn't part of that, so, so I'm unable to comment. Right. Now, um, the, C, the COSC, that is the Chief, the Commissioners and Chief Operating Officers uh, Strategic Committee, you said it meets regularly. Um, as I understand it, it meets April, July, October, and then more regularly as needed during the course of the bushfire season. Is that right? Correct. There's a protocol when there is a um, an emergency or a particular incident that requires that grouping to come together, and there's a short, um, generally 30-minute phone call which identifies the incident, identifies what resources are requested, and um, asks the National Resource Sharing Centre to, to source those resources. Now, the document you provided yesterday uh, for the assistance of the Commission, which I'll just have identified its document reference, uh, AFC.504.001.0001, uh, now Mr Ellis, this is the cost summary report, if I could just have it the... Um, uh, I'm not sure if you can see that well enough, but on that first page, this is uh, um, prepared by AFAC's um, NRSC, uh, and it says that it's as at 1600, Tuesday, 21 January 2020. Um, what, what is this document, Mr Ellis? So, so this, is a, this is a summary of the resource sharing that the NRSC had facilitated at that point in time. So, um, we prepared this document initially on a daily basis and then it moved to a twice weekly basis to keep all states and territories and indeed EMA um, aware and up to date with what, resource, what resources were deploying from where to where. All right. And if we could just go over to the fifth page. I'm sorry, I don't have the coded version of it. Um, that's all right. The fifth page. Uh, that's a situation report for 21 January 2020 for the Australian New Zealand commitment levels for bushfire resources. 
Is this a doc Correct. is and is this situational in this situation report um, is this prepared by AFAC or is it prepared by its shall I I'll call it loosely member agencies and then fed into AFAC? Look, it, it, it's prepared by AFAC, but it's prepared in consultation with each state and territory. So they provide um, their assessment um, relevant to the key there about their their level of um, resource commitment and their availability of resources to assist. Right. So it's a it's a broad indicator. Now um, you've got in. Uh, a red circle number five on the states of New South Wales and Victoria. If we could just go to the key on the left, that could be blown up for level five. Uh, it's a little blurry, but jurisdiction has exceptional levels of resource commitment. Interstate and or international assistance is essential to meet incident objectives. Um, could you just tell the commissioners something about those those levels and how those are arrived at? Yes. So, so this is this was um, developed by by AFAC, by the National Resource Sharing Centre, um, so that we could have a a overview very quickly of how committed different different states and territories were, and people could look at this at a glance, if you like. <coughs> so what's the Reflecting is that New South Wales and Victoria, at that point in time, um, were reliant on additional resources um, assisting them um, to meet their their mission and their their commitment at that time. And so there's there's the gauge of five, and then there's the arrow saying whether that is at a steady state, or that's rising, or that's reducing. And as I said, that's an assessment that we asked the states and territories of and we reflect it um, as a collective document here. All right. And if we could just go down to those three arrows that I think you've just spoken of, of which you've just spoken, excuse me, um, uh, arrow up commitment forecast to increase uh, in less than or equal to three days, the horizontal arrow, no significant commitment change in less than or equal to three days, and then the arrow pointing downwards, commitment forecast to reduce in less than or equal to three days. Um, is there is is there anything that goes beyond that that sort of um, uh, that's a forward looking projection? Is that right? Correct. Um, does this document or a document like this is prepared by AFAC? Uh, take a, shall we say, whole of campaign view, that is looking back, what's the trend been of sharing of resources and resource commitment over the course of the bushfire season? Um, there is, uh, there's, there's probably, there's two levels. There's a um, seasonal outlook that looks at, you know, what we're likely to experience, which is prepared by the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC, certainly with um, considerable involvement of AFAC and its agencies. That gives a broad um, forecast, if you like, a prediction of how the season is presented. Um, we, we did undertake a strategic resource um, plan uh, during this season. Um, and uh, um, we could certainly facilitate that to the Commission. I, I don't know that we have presented that as as part of um, our submission to date, but, but we could do so. Um, but I think it's an area where we can develop further um, with our resource planning and projection in the future. And we're really uh, looking to um, establish some software support for us to be able to not only track resource deployments, but also relate that to what's available and potentially, you know, what would be required and what's available in future weeks and months. I see. Yes, Chair. So that's an area which we need to develop further. So, Mr Ellis, just, just, to, con just to just confirm then, during the 2019-2020 fires, you didn't have a capacity of report 
a mechanism of reported a forecast of resources against what the capacity of the uh, various jurisdictions was. So there was, we can see that there's commitments increasing, no significant in increase, commitments reducing, but that's not measured against a capacity of those jurisdictions at all. So there wouldn't be a national picture on where capacity limits were, were starting to be approached. Um, Commissioner, that's, that's correct. We, we have looked at that previously. Um, the challenge that the challenge there is for each jurisdiction that varies. Their, their capacity varies depending on on their own situation. So, um, at one point in time, they could be well undercommitted. Um, take Western Australia or Queensland, for instance, as we're depicting in this this particular report on the 21st of January. But had a cyclone. Um, entered their jurisdiction, then their capacity to support you know, may well reduce significantly because they're directed to another hazard. So it, 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 there is a real danger in saying, well, for example, um, Western Australia has you know, 20,000 volunteers. They've currently deployed 1,000, 19,000 are available. It, it, it's not that straightforward. One, because um, many of those firefighters are required to be maintained in their home jurisdiction to give uh, fire and emergency coverage um, locally. And so there's only a limited uh, amount of resource that can deploy. Um, and then, as I say, it's very dependent on the jurisdiction at the time, which may vary because of any other natural hazard which uh, could impact that jurisdiction and is currently unforeseen. Yeah, I'll, I'll take your point. The unknown unknowns are very hard to uh, plan, as a famous person once said. But the National Resource, Resource Sharing Centre, from what you're saying, just shares. It has no idea if a jurisdiction is reaching a capacity under the known or forecast uh, conditions. So you well, only know, the National Resource Sharing Centre only knows what might be made available to share, not the capacity of the jurisdiction as a whole. We're reliant on the advice of the jurisdiction at the current time for that. We certainly have uh, ongoing contact to, to get a sense of that, but we are reliant on that advice. Okay, so that picture that's going up there, that national picture, is not really the full story. It's it's. Uh, to what extent you may know at the at the time, uh, based on the information that you are given. Correct. Thank you. Chair, Mr. Ellis, just in relation to that document, can I just take you to notes one and two uh, at the bottom of that page, and we'll have that uh, blown zoomed in by the operator, you should be able to see it. So the first note is that resource commitment includes commitment to actual and anticipated incident activity within the jurisdiction, commitment to interstate and international deployments and commitment to activities such as prescribed burning. So it's quite a broad, um, it captures quite a broad amount of information in relation to commitment activities. It's the first matter, is that right? Correct. All right. That's uh, correct. <clears throat> and the second note is, this is an assessment of commitment levels, not an offer of resource availability. Full stop, resource availability must always be confirmed by specific, re by specific request. The reference to specific request, is that a specific request to a member of the COSC, that is the member of the, one of the chief, uh, sorry, commissioners or um, Chief uh, Operating, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I've forgotten the acronym's uh, name, the Strategic Committee members. Correct. So, so the NRC responds to, to requests as they're made for additional resources. I see. Um, and, and we don't have the capacity at the current time, as, as Commissioner asked, to be forward looking. I think we should, um, but we don't, have, we don't have that capacity currently. And um, you know, the, the decision to, to share resources, as I think I said earlier, always remains the responsibility of the jurisdictional commissioners and chief officers. Um, so that's 
that's that is always their decision. NRC puts out the request and uh, accepts the offers, but it doesn't in any way dictate or demand. And just to indicate, I, won't, I don't propose to ask you any questions about this matter today because um, this matter will become uh, 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 be further explored in subsequent hearing blocks. Uh, if I could just have identified the subsequent pages, so that's page six, which is interstate and international deployments for 21 January 2020. That's the New South Wales uh, sector of activity, of, of, sorry, of commitment levels, is that right? Correct. Right. And then uh, the next one is, the next page, location of interstate and international resources uh, in the Victorian sector, or at least to the, on the, I think it's to the east of Victoria, the East Gippsland region of Victoria. Well, yes, where, where the fires were and support was being requested at the time. And just noting on that map, um, that includes uh, that includes a fire scar that's on the other side of the border of Victoria, that is into New South Wales. Correct. Right. And then the uh, the next one, is, the last one of the document, is location of international resources. Uh, this is a, a showing a sector or a segment of South Australia. Correct. And uh, can see a substantial burn scar um, to the west of Kangaroo Island. That's right, and where where international um, firefighters were deployed, assisting them. So, just in relation the, to, uh, oh, sorry, Mr. Ellis, I cut you. I cut you uh, off. <clears throat> Uh, just in relation to uh, international resources, so you said before um, uh, the northern and southern hub and the New Zealand hub is about when Australian uh, resources personnel are deployed overseas, but part of the, uh, the role, as I understand it, of the National Resource Sharing Centre and AFAC is to uh, coordinate or be a funnel in some way for international resources that come into Australia. Is that right? That's correct. It's There are arrangements with both the uh, United States of America and Canada, and uh, they are um, long-standing arrangements, but they're arrangements that, that require considerable um, effort and uh, discussion, you know, before these, these incidents occur. And so we've been evolving those arrangements over a number of years, and it's it's the AFAC NRSC, which is responsible for developing and maintaining those arrangements with their counterparts in the United States and Canada. And does the Commonwealth have a role in relation to the facilitating the, in, the deployment of international resources into Australia for the purposes of fire and emergency management? That, that, that certainly assisted from the point of view of um, um, assisting with uh, border, border force and um, diplomatic um, access, um, but the actual discussions, the agreements themselves, um, and the relationships are all maintained by AFAC. When we when we establish those those arrangements, we um, did ask EMA to be a signatory on those arrangements because it. Um, highlighted that this that these arrangements had government endorsement, but um, they're not formal uh, Department of Foreign Affairs agreements, or uh, um, they are literally court arrangements for that reason to separate them out from a, a formal government document. Um, but as I say, they they are developed and maintained by AFAC. Um, with with our counterparts in the United States and Canada. Right. Um, if you just excuse me for one moment, Mr. Um, Ellis, I think we have included those arrangements in 
in the tender bundle, but I can't presently spot it. We'll come back to that, Mr. Um, Mr. Ellis, uh, whilst that's being turned up. Ah, oh, yes, here it is. Um, could the witness be shown uh, HA, HAF.0003.0002.0047? So this is the arrangement between the Department of Agriculture and the Department of the Interior of the United States on the one side and Emergency Management Australia on the other side concerning the exchange of wildland, wildland fire management resources. Is this one of the arrangements that you were just speaking, of which you were just speaking, Mr Ellis? It is. I, I thought you just said that AFAC was the party to it or did I, I didn't, perhaps I wasn't following your, um, your, uh, your evidence carefully enough. Um, well, the, because of the US government involvement, you are correct, we have put um, Emergency Management Australia as, as the body. I That's see. correct. Um, the Commissioner Bennett. Um, I'm sorry, I just, I just happened to note that in the you know, one between Canada and um, Australia again, it seems to be um, Emergency Management Australia as the other party as well. Uh, that's HAF.0003.0002.0047. That's the document you're referring to, Commissioner Bennett? Uh, yes, it was. Perhaps by way of assistance, uh, Mr. Mr Ellis, could I take you to um, a document produced by a uh, AFAC, which is AFC.502.001.0836. This is behind tab 35, Commissioners, which is the operating plan. Is the operating plan the uh, the document that is of relevance of particular relevance to AFAC? Correct. So, so we have that principal arrangement document, and I apologise for the confusion, which is signed by um, the government departments, effectively, as we identified, and then we have the operating plans, which are the detail of how the arrangements work and. Those um, documents which are updated more regularly um, are, yes, what concerns AFAC specifically. Right. Now, just to assist you, um, Mr Ellis, I'll take you to the Canadian one as well, which is behind tab 37, Commissioners. That's AFC 502-001-0647. And that's the Canadian one being shown now, Mr. Um, Mr. Ellis. Now, I don't propose, uh, other than just to sketch those to you today, I just wanted to deal with those by way of clarification. We will be seeking um, uh, further assistance from AFAC as we progress through the course of the Royal Commission's um, inquiries. Uh, but thank you for making that clarification, uh, or assisting us with that clarification. The... Um, uh, you were speaking about of the deployment of international resources and the tracking of those international resources. Um, some of the evidence that has been provided to the Royal Commission thus far indicates that there is a prolonging of the fire season not only in Australia but also in, in the um, Northern Hemisphere. Um, how, is, how is that, if at all, managed um, as an issue for the use of international resources, for the deployment of international resources into Australia? 
look, that's a, that's an ongoing discussion that that we have with both um, Canada and the United States. It, it it hasn't impacted directly on availability um, to the to the current point in time, but it's it's something we're all conscious of. What it does um, with a secondary impact, if you like, when when people make those deployments, or in, for, in fact, for when Australian firefighters make those deployments, which tend to occur in August or September, then what it does, um, what the flow on is that those firefighters who may have been on leave, may not have taken leave, or may be involved in prescribed burning um, during the spring, and may not be available for that activity. So there, there are um, secondary impacts, if you like, but we haven't had a situation where the crossing of the seasons or the extending of the seasons ha has led to non-availability. Just excuse me one moment, Mr um, Ellis. I'm just trying to... The you said earlier that the the regular meetings of the uh, um, of the council. Uh, April was the most recent one, is that right? Correct. And you've included in your materials um, the minutes of the meeting of 30 April 2020. Um, this is the last matter I wanted to sketch out today and we'll return in the course of the inquiry uh, to the state and territories and others may, uh, and the Commonwealth um, can assist us further. Um, AFC.502.001-1049 behind tab 28. Um, amongst the materials provided to the Commission is um, assessment site by the uh, by AFAC uh, on the uh, on the 2019-2020 bushfire season. Uh, and a debriefing, noting a debriefing process having taken place just down to the key points under the first dot point there. Just at the bottom there, if that could be zoomed into it. Um, just noting there, Mr Ellis, that the 2019-2020 bushfire season saw by far the largest nationally coordinated interstate and international deployment of fire and emergency personnel ever to have been mounted in Australia. Over the course of the campaign, there have been over 7,000 international and interstate personnel deployed into ACT, Queensland, South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria, achieved by administering hundreds of individual deployments each lasting from three to 35 days. Just pausing there, when you say administering, is that is that AFAC that you're referring to or was, and the Resource Sharing Centre? Yep, correct, right. correct. Um, and uh, you then go on to say the key outcomes of the debriefing process, which we have identified for further consideration and action are, now I just want to take you through these. The first is, um, uh, there may be a need for AFAC in collaboration with the eastern states to undertake a strategic analysis of fleet and role capacity and consider if there is a need to expand the fleet or create a reserve. Is that reference to the aerial assets and fleet or is that some other uh, equipment fleet such as um, vehicles? Um, no, that's the aerial assets. Um, the next page... Uh, it is the first one. It is recommended a national strategy be developed before the 2020-2021 bushfire season, which addresses scalability and logistics of aerial firefighting retardants, gels and foams. Now, just pausing there, we're going to speak with Mr uh, Aldo, who may be able to assist more in that. Um, but is that... Uh, um, uh, so I'll just pause and leave that there for one moment. Um, you then identify four matters uh, for um, NRSC to work 
and to review and to develop uh, over the course of, uh, well, into the future. Um, just to ask you globally, uh, are those, is that work ongoing now? That, that, that work is um, yeah, currently underway. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, th th that's occurring at, at the current time. What um, a lot of it uh, is centres around is, is a software system to manage um, personnel resource deployments, um, a personal registry, if you like, which um, allows to, to best manage the movement of personnel in and out of jurisdictions. Right. And uh, that project has commenced. Um, and is that that first dot point? A, in particular, uh, to work with jurisdictions develop, to develop a more automated and efficient way to ensuring there's a standardised approach to resource requests? Correct. Right. And, and um, just going down below those four, there's a new one, review distribution lists and look at online portal accessibility and solutions. Is that, is that also part of the, um, the technologies, technology project you've described? It is. Right. It is. So, so, to, so to put it in context, um, the NRC has been in place for three years. It's it's rapidly evolving, right? Um, and this is part of that development continuum. But the but and uh, is it is it the case that thus far the role that EMA is EMA has that is the Commonwealth has in what is otherwise a a, a body of the state and territory emergency and fire uh, agencies uh, is as a co-chair of the COSC, the strategic committee. Correct. And that feeds into the National Resource Sharing Centre work or is it quite separate for this work? I'll put that again in fairness Sorry, to you. Kidding. Yes, I'll put that again in fairness to you, Mr. Mr. Ellis. Um, what role, if any, as you understand it, uh, will the Commonwealth Emergency Management Australia have in relation to those four dot points of the work program for NRSC? Um, well, no, no direct involvement. There, there, um, there may be some funding involvement, I see. but but no direct involvement. The work's being undertaken by AFAC at the current time. All right. Um, the, uh, on page um, uh, 1053, under the heading Reporting and Administration, We just have that pa paragraph picked up. The, the action item, I'll come back to the, the content, the action item is that, is one of those action items before, which is at AFAC NRSC, consider further improvements and developments to reporting templates and automation and standardisation of resource trackers, situational reporting systems and processes. Um, the first dot point uh, identifies that as the 2019-2020 season continued, the NRSC was increasingly called on to provide national situational reporting data, e.g. to EMA, ministers and international partners. Uh, this included tracking cumulative totals of deployees. Um, as NRSC may not have had full visibility of movements, e.g. cross-border, it's essential that ILU and NISC agree on clear expectations for reporting data requirements from the start while allowing flexibility to adapt and agree on a meeting on meeting emerging needs. Um, what's, the, what's the ILU reference there? International Liaison Units. And what's the International Liaison Unit? Well, well it, 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 it is um, international um, officers that come out as liaison and they reside in the NRSC, report back to Canada, report back to the United States. And um, so they have their own reporting requirements. And so it's reflecting that that what system we put in place 
needs to satisfy international requirements as well as domestic requirements. Right. Um, the next dot point is the newly developed situation map with activity oh. ratings 1 to 5 of Australia and New Zealand was beneficial. Is that the situation map that we were looking at earlier, that was attached to the, uh, the COSC report, summary report? It isn't. Yes, it is. All right. Uh, and uh, the next dot point, the NISC resource tracker tool, despite teething issues at the start, was beneficial. Uh, what was the resource tracker tool that you're speaking of there? Look, that, that was um, Excel spreadsheets and, and arrangements we, we had in place within the NRSC um, to, to maintain um, that reporting that you saw in that, that uh, NRC situation report, I that COSC situation report. All right. And I, I didn't take, in fairness, I didn't take the commissioners to the whole of that document, but it did have in the earlier pages a number of tables which, from, as I understand it from what you've just said, Mr Ellis, is the output of those Excel spreadsheets. Is that right? Correct. I see. Now, um, you go on in that dot point, not, sorry, it, so it, is, it, it proceeds in that dot point, issues with management of the resource trackers and data quality due to constant staff changeovers needs to be considered. How is the NRSC staffed? So the NRSC has um, three permanent staff um, from AFAC, um, but during this deployment, or during this summer, because of the level of activity and the intensity um, there was, a, in addition, a duty officer that was um, largely sourced from South Australian State Emergency Service, um, but oops, latterly New South Wales State Emergency Service. So officers came across and spent between five and seven days rotating as duty officers. And then there were a number of international liaison officers as well. Um, and then in further support were other AFAC staff that assisted as required with communications, resource tracking, ICT, etc. Uh, does the does AFAC second staff as well, or is that captured by what you've just described? Second from member eight from uh, member agencies? Yes, we do. We also have um, resource managers that are located in the jurisdiction requesting assistance um, so so they also rotated over around a week perhaps a little less um, so secondments longer term secondments we we do have from time to time but during the height of um, of the summer season agencies are um, reluctant to second people for longer periods um, when you speak of agencies, does that include any Commonwealth agencies? Um, so EMA at times has also sent uh, liaison officers to the NRSC and indeed they send liaison officers to their state control centres. Um, yeah, but we, we haven't um, formally seconded Commonwealth people into AFAC. All right. Um, the so is there a is there what what is there a sort of a standing capability within um, uh, NRSC audits from what you've described is it 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 sort of expands and contracts as as the need um, arises. Correct, correct. We we identified from the season that there needs to be a standing capacity that. There is a, a core capacity, if you like, mm -hmm. as, I, as I mentioned, of, of three staff, but that's not a sustainable number um, to maintain the NRC during ongoing deployments. Mm -hmm. So that, that number does need to increase. We, we have identified a structure for that. It, it's quite modest. Um, and uh, we are very keen to put that in place. We've sought funding from the Commonwealth to do that. And we've identified that during um, downtimes, if you like, apart from other preparation, um, 
those individuals to be involved in facilitating exercising, which would be equally a value, you know, valuable for for this role. Yeah. Um, just um, I note the time. Just one more question from me uh, uh, at this moment, um, Mr. Ellis. Uh, at the bottom of the page concerns unsolicited international officers of assistance, and then uh, over the next uh, two pages over. Uh, 1055 um, deals with confirming, uh, this is one of the actions, confirm international assistance protocol with EMA. Is there no protocol in place at this point of time? Look, there, there, there was, I think probably <laughs> fair to say, multiple protocols. And at the uh, April Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee, it was agreed that all international office of assistance would be managed uh, by EMA and directed to EMA. So during this season, some were managed at the state level, some were managed by the National Resource Sharing Centre, keeping EMA informed, and a large number were managed by EMA. But it was agreed that in future, all international office of assistance would be um, directed to and managed by EMA. Right. Um Commissioners, I note the time. There may be additional questions uh, uh, from you. The, um, it, and it, we also may just need to um, pause. I think uh, we might take an adjournment for 15 minutes, then we'd like to come back, because I do have a few questions okay. for Mr Ellis, and I know the other commissioners do as well. Mr Ellis, what, what would we propose? If you could stay on the line, uh, and the uh, witness liaison people will, will um, communicate with you during the adjournment, uh, and if you'd be so good as to be uh, ready in 15 minutes, uh, the commissioners will have additional questions, and if I have any more, I'll, 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 I'll bring them immediately to your attention. So we'll uh, adjourn and then we will come back at uh, 10 to 12. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.
commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Mr Ellis, noting we will get uh, AFAC back uh, later on in the commission uh, as we start to look at more of the, uh, the, the coordination issues in the, in the future. We do have a couple of questions uh, first up, just to try and set the context of AFAC uh, as an organisation. So I'll go back to Ms Hogan Doran first, and then I have a couple of questions as do the other commissioners. Uh, Mr Ellis, just the one uh, series, one uh, topic that I wanted to take you to, which I flagged during the course of my examination with you earlier, which was the AFAC strategy document. I think you mentioned. 2019-2023, I'll have that brought up on the screen, AFC 502 001 0081. Uh, just one moment, Commissioners, I'll tell you the tab. Hmm? 40. 40. Thank you. Sorry, Commissioner. Um, if you could go to, yeah, it's tab 40. Um, if the, Mr Ellis could be shown the organisational relationships chart on page um, 0090. Now, this is over two pages. I'll just see if it can be brought up. Also, 0091. We may be able to have them both together. Yes, there we go. Uh, now, um, Mr Ellis, uh, so in the centre of that chart, so this, this is the significant organisational relationships for AFAC, um, in that chart the centre point is the AFAC board and above that the AFAC National Council. Correct. And um, if we trace down from the AFAC board, we go down to um, COSC and then down to NRSC, and yes. then you've got interstate, international, and Pacific. I didn't ask you about Pacific. Yes. What's 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 um, the NRSC's role in relation to the Pacific? Um, so AFAC has has a number of uh, co linkages with Pacific Island Fire Services. It's been a long-standing arrangement with over a dozen individual agencies linking to fire services in the Pacific. Um, we have a Pacific strategy where we engage and support those fire services. Um, and so it, it, it's an area of developing opportunity. Right. Um, a lot of the work is done by individual agencies currently, but again, following that theme of having that national situational awareness, we are asking um, agencies when they deploy individuals, either in support or for training, to um, Pacific Island areas that they keep um, the National Resource Sharing Centre aware so we can report accordingly. I see. Now, um, also coming out from the AFAC board is on the on page 9-1 is the NAFSI Strategic Committee and below that, the research committee. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, am I right in understanding, or well, the commissioner's right in understanding that, that NAFSI, which is the National Aerial Firefighting Centre Strategic Committee, is um, now made up of uh, of representatives who were previously on the board of um, the National Australia Firefighting Centre when that was a, an, an active. Uh, um, Company Limited by Guarantee registered charity up to about 2018. Correct. And it's no the longer. Individuals may have changed. I apologise. Sorry, I individuals may have changed. The individuals may have changed. Certainly, the yeah, the representation remains the same. Yes. And so, previously, there was a there was a second company that is. Um, NAFSI itself was a company limited by guarantee, but now, as I understand it, or the commissioners ought to understand it, uh, those activities of NAFSI have now been brought in under uh, the AFAC corporate entity. Is that right? Correct. That is correct. And it's now a strategic committee of um, the AFAC board. Correct. All right. Um, the 
other matter I wanted to raise, you said um, we can see on this, this document uh, the AFAC Conference Limited, which I think was one of the matters you pointed, that's a dotted line to that separate company, uh, AIDR, which is the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience, uh, and you've, you've identified their, it's identified their professional development and knowledge management as part of the, uh, the, the collaborative and act activities that have undertaken within the Resilience um, Institute. Is that right? Correct. Uh, yes. You've got a dotted line to research management with a question mark. What does that signify? So the Bushfire Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre is, um, which has been in place um, since 2014, is in is approaching its last year. It's its wind down year, and so um, from an AFAC board and council perspective, it is it is going to um, govern future research, and so that's put it there as a. Uh, as a proposed arrangement. Um, those decisions are with government currently and haven't been uh, decided. And so that's why it's got a question mark under that. I see. It's a forward looking projection. And if we go across to a collaboration framework, uh, what does that refer to? So AFAC maintains 34 groups. Um, which was when I, I mentioned the 800 senior people from different agencies that come together and those groups um, really are a very cost effective and structured way for learning, sharing ideas, looking at best practice, developing national positions and procedures. And so that's, that's one of the core um, activities that AFAC maintains is maintaining those 34 collaboration groups which meet through the year. I see. And you've got uh, dotted lines down to MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding, Memoranda of Understanding, I suppose. Uh, Standards Australia, ABCB, what's ABCB? Australian Building Codes Board. And FFMT? So um, the Forest Fire Management Group. Right. I cut you off when you were saying ABCB, you were saying the Australian Building Codes Board. Or, yes, I mean, they are very relevant for issues of urban fire safety and urban construction and fire prevention in in urban environments. I see. Um, the reference to Standards Australia, what dealings, what's the relationship there and or to what purpose is that relationship with Standards Australia? <coughs> so so <clears throat> AFAC has, has a long-standing and detailed involvement with Standards Australia. AFAC is represented in over 50 different standards committees. Um, one of the AFAC staff chair um, an international standard to do with uh, personal protective equipment. Um, so we're very involved in discussions in the St Standards Australia um, committee environment um, regarding establishing and, and maintaining the various standards around all aspects of fire prevention, fire safety, fire equipment. And if we could just go up to EMPS, <coughs> what does EMPS? So, so the emergency, EMPS refers to the Emergency Management Professionalisation Scheme, um, which is a credentialing scheme developed by the, by the sector um, to confirm individual expertise, experience, currency, um, and it's, so it's, it's establishing a platform to put emergency management practitioners on a professional setting. I see. And that's an ongoing project of, the, of AFAC, is it? It is indeed. Uh, and the final one, predictive services. I think this is one of the other companies. Is it a separate company or just a business unit? Look, that's there is a predictive. There's a, there's a fire, um, a fire prediction company, which is the company that looks after um, uh, the Phoenix Rapid Fire Simulation. Yes. Was responsible for the Phoenix Rapid Fire 
simulation. This this here isn't depicting that company directly, um, but it is depicting the broader prediction services um, area, if you like, which includes warnings, national fire danger rating system is the NFDRS, and, and broader hazard predictions. Um, so it was just identifying that that really has, has been um, depicted here as an area of growth and development into the future. Part of that is that predictive services company. Um, you, you do deal with those matters in quite some detail in the, uh, the response that has been provided by AFAC, and I anticipate that we'll uh, seek some further information to, and assistance for the commissioners in, as you say, the development of this area of work. Uh, if I could just go to the top of the page then, uh, in the orange and the green boxes at the top of the page, so a dotted line up through the AFAC National Council to EMA and Home Affairs, they're references to the Commonwealth's uh, Department of Home Affairs and uh, its division, Emergency Management Australia? Correct. And to the side, ANZ EMC, which is the Australian New Zealand Emergency Management Council, is that correct? Committee. Committee, yeah. Committee, all right. Great. And that statement of uh, that identification of significant organisational relationships, that is, as I understand what you've said, uh, this is the strategy for 2019 to 2023. Is that... Uh, the picture as it was as the relationships were as at the beginning of that period of 2019? Correct. And, and has that changed as at this point, say one to two years later? I'm not sure of the date of this document. Yeah, look, potentially not. I think that's fairly consistent um, with the current arrangements. Thank you so much, Mr Ellis. That's all I wish to ask of you today. Mr. Hogan Doran. Mr Ellis, a couple of questions for you, please. If we can, we could stay in that document, but I won't. I'll take you to AFC.502.001.2 .0186, which is flag 31, and it's the AFAC Charter dated March 2020. Just uh, a, a question for you, and, I, and only because we're, we're still trying to baseline where AFAC fits into to all this from a national perspective. But if I take you to page 0189, and just go AFAC's purpose, please. It's about halfway down under the overview. So this is the, in your charter, this is your purpose, a facilitator and custodian of contemporary foreign emergency service knowledge and practice. It, that's good, but from what you've told us today and from that previous diagram, it appears that you've got a couple of business units that also work in the operational world. They're making operational decisions and they're beyond just being facilitator and custodian of contemporary foreign emergency service knowledge. It seems like AFAC has grown. I, know, I understand it's a complicated space out there. Do you feel that there's a need to change in your charter what AFAC is all about? Um, Commissioner, I'll, I'll, I would, uh, with respect, offer um, from an operational perspective, AFAC doesn't make decisions. AFAC is not operational. Um, AFAC facilitates and is an operational enabler. Um, I think we're, that, that second statement will be recognised and have impact as a national council. I, can I, I just jump in on, before you get the second part. statement? I can go back through the yeah. transcript, but you said COSC makes decisions, made decisions in 2019 and 2020, and COSC directed NRSC to source resources. Correct. So that's not that's not that's that's not a fact. That is a committee of the commissioners and chief officers which happens to be AFAC is the secretariat for, and yes, it's a subcommittee um, within the existing structure, but it's not, it's not AFAC, you know, it's not AFAC limited. 
Okay, I'll need, I'll need to go back to that previous diagram then, because also you talked about AFAC managed international offers, so that could be a bit of facilitate, but, but I, you can see where I'm coming from. I'm having a hard time seeing where, where the space AFAC is, is positioned and what AFAC, how are you filling a void that is there? It appears that that's the case, but that diagram that's up there now has a hard line between the AFAC board and COSC to NRSC. It, it does have a hard line, Commissioner, that's, that's correct. And it is effectively, from a governance perspective, a subcommittee of the AFAC board, but it also has a line directly to EMA. And that... Um, that's a dotted that, line to I, EMA, right? Yeah, 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 it's a dotted line. Yeah. As... Um, as I've reiterated a number of occasions, the, the decisions of COSC aren't, aren't vetted by the AFAC board, aren't reviewed by the AFAC board, um, and certainly all resource sharing decisions are decisions of commissioners and chief officers who are responsible for those resources. Okay, so, so when, NRSC when does not then enact that decision, or do they? Yeah, NRSC. NRSC does enact those decisions. Yes, it, it does. Okay, and they uh, are a part of AFAC. Yes, correct. Okay. All right. I, again, I think your purpose does not state exactly what AFAC is doing there. Not, and again, it's a it's a governance issue. But I just, again, we're trying to just get an understanding of uh, where you fit in the national coordination side and so for for us as commissioners it's quite important and it will be something that we'll explore down down track I think when we get a better chance to to, to look at it um, so I'll leave that there because I think we still we still have questions in the future for that the one other thing that I've got for you today is early on in your submission to the, the commission, and it's, and, and I won't take you the document, but it, it said that you don't consider that there are any significant gaps in national coordination of firefighting in 19, 2019, 2020, and none have been identified. That was a 27 April document. There've been a lot of other submissions since then where you've talked about some of the coordination lessons and that uh, out of it. Again, what I'll do is we'll wait until we get you back uh, AFAC as an organisation back again, but we'd li would like to explore that and make sure after that submission to come in and with all the activities that have taken place after the fact that you haven't not identified uh, any improvements uh, or major gaps that might um, need to be addressed. So I'll leave it at that and uh, I'll look to Commissioner Bennett for any questions. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Mr Ellis. I'm also just trying to get some better understanding about where AFAC sits. So I'm going to come up, I'm just going to take a couple of comments that are in the written material and the comments you've made and then try and understand what happens. In your submission to the Commission, you pointed out um, at uh, um, NND 001008240.01-0, it's a very straightforward a comment really, which is that the Commonwealth Government has no constitutional role in managing um, emergencies affecting individual states and territories. And then at page 0014, you say AFAC's mission is dictated in part by the fact that there is no arm of government currently tasked with ensuring national collaboration and coordination of emergency management. And then you've made some comments and, I, you know, you say that it's got an operationally enabling responsibility, I think you said today. There's a lot of talk about facilitation. And it's also recognised in various documents, and I don't think I need to take you to it, that um, you're also looking at the role of consistency and interoperability across across the different jurisdictions. And I think you've, there's a lot of discussion about the fact that you're um, facilitating discussion, urging or suggesting that things happen. There are recommendations um, to be adopted and also with matters such as resource sharing. So what I want to have an understanding of, bearing in mind that it would seem that the only real direction that the EMA and the Department of Home Affairs has is through COSC, and you know, then when that's also in that difficult area, I want to ask you some questions then about 
um, monitoring of implementation. I mean, you can recommend, you can suggest, um, you're, you're recommending a greater national role in resource sharing rather than uh, through the National Resource Allocation Centre rather than bilateral arrangements. So my general questions go, to what extent do you check whether or not your recommendations are implemented? To what extent can you monitor adoption by the states, for example, not to have bilateral arrangements except in you know, those 20 to 50 kilometre border areas that you arranged? And to what extent do you actually um, benchmark whether your recommendations are adopted and to enable you to have some sort of a methodology in that regard to see what's actually happening on the ground, bearing in mind that you see yourselves as the only body with a national involvement. Now, do you understand the qu what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, no, no, I think I do, Commissioner. The, um, it, it, it's quite a um, familiar environment um, for those involved within, within the Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee and indeed AFAC Council. Um, we meet you know, three times a year, there's there's a good deal of stability amongst that group. There there is very broad awareness of um, when two jurisdictions enter into a bilateral agreement. I mean, you you, you can't hide uh, de deploying people um, from one state to another. So that's been discussed at COSC. That's been discouraged at COSC. Um, we don't have any, any enforcement role at all, but, but in all things um, that are undertaken by AFAC Council and indeed within the COSC environment, there's a very strong and long-standing collaborative arrangement um, and uh, you know, cooperative willingness. It's the commissioners and chiefs um, working together with themselves and that's, that's developed a singular purpose um, and a capacity in, in nearly every situation to be come to an agreed decision. It's, it's not always universal, but uh, there are very few instances that I can recall where, where you know, a state or a, a number of states are in disagreement because of that collaborative arrangement that's developed over a long time. And that's one of the strengths of AFAC um, is it's, it, it's we need to separate in part, and it is difficult, I agree, but AFAC Limited, which is the, you know, the the structure which has been chosen, the framework, if you like, to make this happen, and AFAC itself, which are the fire and emergency agencies, which do work very collaboratively and cooperatively together. But to just to, I understand, I understand that, that it's, you know, that it is collaborative, but in terms of AFAC, you know, I mean, you've got a lot of documentation where you've set out various recommendations and principles and matters that you say should be adopted. We referred to one of them today to work to propose interim arrangements for national resource prioritisation. Do you have a system in place at all within AFAC where you actually monitor, benchmark and record implementation? of the various recommendations that you make. I understand you say we all sort of know because we're in the room, but I mean, that's not quite the same thing when you're seeking to have a national prioritisation role or a, a national resource allocation role, a national uh, coordination, um, national interoperability recommendations. Um, you know, is there any systematic methodology within AFAC or reporting back, um, even if it means that you put uh, a collegial pressure on, uh, by way of collegial pressure on jurisdictions that don't wish to adopt the recommendations, that you actually benchmark what is happening or record it or report it back within the AFAC meetings and structures? Look, there, I, I, can't, I, I can't lead you to a, um, a formal framework of reporting. Certainly on, on different issues that has occurred and the, the code read um, catastrophic um, uh, category is one um, where it's still at the end of the day the government of Victoria chose a different path but you know that there was a lot of collegiate um, pressure put at, at that time um, so so there isn't a formal reporting structure but often in those collaboration groups those issues are are discussed and and resolved 
Um, yeah, but, but there's no formal framework which I can lead you to. Well, just humour me here, actually, if I may just take one... one um, uh, pick up on that point about the terminology. I couldn't help but notice in the documentation that you've been spending now some years looking at getting the framework for the three stages of prepar uh, pre uh, preparedness for firefighting. And there you've had surveys and, and um, uh, all sorts of discussions, I think, about what should be the three stages to go out to the community for education purposes. Um, is that a situation where the collaboration, as because you say Victoria, for example, doesn't want to adopt the same terminology? How can it take three years just to get a an approach? And it's not yet finalised, I don't think. Although it started, I think, in 2016 from the documentation, on what the three stages, you know, the green, orange, and red, um, should be. I mean, how where is that going? Is that is that now being put to bed? Uh, Commissioner, that, that's very near completion. It was discussed at the um, most recent Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee. There's one, one terminology, one term that we are reviewing further. It did involve, you know, one of the broadest um, social researchers, research activities that's been conducted in in Australia. Um, you know, without wanting to sound cynical, I think in um, three years for some issues of federation are, is fast. What? Whether we should have watch um, an act or lot. not watch an act? Sorry, I just, it just intrigued me. I, I would have thought this is something that's so important that should have been, you know, we're, bearing in mind we're facing fire seasons, that th that would have been something. I don't wish to go off on a tangent on it because it's only one, one matter. And I know you've conducted surveys. It just seemed um, that if that's an example of... Uh, to me, that was just interesting that, that uh, with all the collegiality uh, involved, that that matter had not been resolved. But I, I don't think it's the most, most important one I'm thinking of. So um, uh, just only one other matter coming back to um, where um, what a I'd be interested to know what role you see AFAC as playing on having um, jurisdictional consistencies and interoperability of, of equipment and communications methodologies. Do you see AFAC as having a role in that? And again, how do you um, implement that, if you do? So, so we, we certainly do. I mean, communications is a very significant issue because it's such a large investment for states and territories over such a long term. I think that's probably a separate issue we need to discuss and address. But for other equipment, um, certainly AFAC has set standards for couplings, um, PPE, uh, vehicles. At, at the end of the day, a, a, AFAC comes to a common agreement on the standard. Whether it's adopted or not is a responsibility of the states and territories. But what we've found is during subsequent inquiries, Royal Commissions indeed, uh, and other reviews, where jurisdictions have not chosen to adopt the AFAC standard, then they're, they're asked why. Um, but, but our role is to establish that standard um, and to have confidence in that standard. And then, as we say, it's up to um, individual agencies and jurisdictions to adopt it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr Ellis. That was uh, good. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mr Ellis, for this morning, for helping us out. Um, two quick questions. One, just, I want to come back to your response to the Chair's question about COSC. It, just for my purposes, is it fair to say that where the Commissioners and the Chiefs are sitting in COSC, they're representing their home jurisdictions rather than acting on behalf of AFAC? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. AFAC facilitate the opportunity. Yep, great. Um, and, and following on from that, in where you're discussing in COSC matters of uh, interstate assistance, is it fair to say that um, the ultimate responsibility and power for making decisions about the deployment of resources from a state rests with the representative from the sending jurisdiction? Absolutely. No, that's right. And, and and I do appreciate that having these arrangements within a not-for-profit company appears odd. It, it is exactly the same arrangement that exists in Canada, 
Um, and indeed, even in Australia, Department of Foreign Affairs uses a not-for-profit company um, referred to as REDR, R-E-D-R, that facilitates its humanitarian deployments overseas. So it's, it's a mechanism to enact the deployment. It's not a body that is making decisions about resource deployment. Yep. No, I, I thank you very much. I was just trying to clarify when a lot of people say that COSC made a decision, but actually it, it's, it's the representative of the jurisdictions making the decisions within the committee. Correct. Yep. Thanks very much. Mr Hellas, thank you very much. We could go on for a while, but uh, um, I would appreci I, I appreciate you giving us the time to give us a good understanding of AFAC. Uh, and where it sits in the in the broader organisation uh, for responding to natural disasters in Australia. And thank you for your time this morning. We appreciate it very much. Ms Hogan Doran. Commissioners. Commissioners, I was just confirming that there hadn't been any communications with parties from, with leave to appear. Um, but as we note, Mr uh, Mr Ellis and or um, and or other mm. members of AFAC. Uh, uh, we anticipate we'll be asking to assist us further in the course of the Commission's inquiry. No, we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Might, um, um, might Mr Ellis be excused? Mr Ellis may be excused. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, Commissioner, just for the benefit of the transcript, I said earlier today I, I doubted that the two AFAC responses were both dated 25 May because they were responding to different notices, but in fact I'm instructed they were 20, both responded to on the same day, which was uh, 25 May, which was last week, last Monday. Thank you. Uh, so that there's no, no change to the tender list. Um, I'm, I'm mindful that Mr Alder has been waiting some, so, some time, so I'll leave the documents I propose to tender until I've concluded my questioning for him and I call, if that's, if that's convenient to... No, that's convenient. I don't want to keep him waiting too, too much uh, I call Richard Alder. Mr Alder, good to see you again. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, that's a pleasure. Uh, Mr. Elder, will you take an oath or affirmation? Um, an affirmation is fine. Okay. Mr. Elder, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um, Mr. Elder, I uh, did you hear the evidence of Mr. Ellis? Um, uh, Council, I heard most of the evidence, yes, with some brief interruptions. Yes. All right, all right. Well, if, if I need to specifically refer to his evidence, I'll do so expressly. Uh, but I'll also try not to overlap the evidence uh, because of the uh, issues of time that we have. Could you just sketch for the commissioners, so your role as the general manager of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre within, the, um, within AFAC, is that right? That's correct. And what was your background before you came into that role? Um, so uh, my, my um, background is, is originally essentially in land management, land management agencies and, and forestry. Um, so I entered that industry back in uh, 1977, <laughs> um, some time ago. Um, and have uh, and up until the early 2000s worked for the various iterations of land management agency that's now become Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning in Victoria um, in, in field and head office roles and, and gradually specialising into fire and then fire aviation um, roles. Right. Um, uh, from uh, the early 2000s, I was sort of involved from that perspective in the um, formation of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, um, then moved into in, into managing that centre from uh, 2004. That was still on a sort of part-time seconded basis from, um, I think it was Department of Sustainability Environment at the time in Victoria, and then full-time in that role from 2011. Mm. Um, uh, I have also undertaken various field-based roles in, term, in, in the incident management system, um, 
such as Air Attack Supervisor and Air Operations Manager been previously accredited mm -hmm. um, in those roles and also for training people in those roles. Um, well, I have to say, not recently. <laughs> um, um, and I am, am also a licensed uh, private pilot, uh, fixed wing aeroplanes, flying various single and twin engine aeroplanes, and uh, did hold a command multi engine instrument rating as well. Right. So you bring a breadth of aviation. experience to yep. the role of general manager? Um, certainly over quite a long time, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, within with your role of Jets General Manager, how how big is is NAFC, NAFC these days? So you spoke about it, um, uh, you being seconded in two thousand and four and coming on full time two thousand and eleven. What's the what's the size and status of the centre now? Um, look, I think in in many ways it's parallel to the NRSC, the National Resource Sharing Centre, in in that it's it's a facilitating and an enabling organisation that that exists to serve the members, the jurisdictional agencies that um, deal with fire and natural hazards. Um, and just to mention that um, it's it's grown from sort of. Two people a decade or so ago, we now have roughly five full-time equivalent people um, working, although right at the moment we have some extra project officers as well working on specific project projects, but not on, on an ongoing basis. It's between four and five people. I see. Uh, I'm going to come to some different aspects of this in a moment, but you said it's a facilitator and enabler. Um, amongst the activities that, that NAFC does, it doesn't own or operate any aircraft itself in aerial firefighting, is that right? That's that's correct. Um, and it, pro it, it it procures aerial firefighting um, services uh, on behalf of uh, the member agencies. Is that correct? Uh, that that's correct. And perhaps just a little bit of additional context uh, there in that when when. Um, NAFC was originally formed in 2003. Um, it was essentially because um, the, the state saw a, a need, a, an opportunity to do things better in terms of aerial firefighting when we're dealing with um, relatively expensive, highly specialised, but also particularly highly mobile resources. Um, so, um, and you know, there's a, there's a number of um, ways in which we can deliver that, but one is to conduct procurement on behalf of the, the state and territory agencies. Yep. Is the, is the, you spoke about facilitator and enabler. In, in the sense of being uh, having a role in relation to the procurement of contracted aerial firefighting services, is the description of broker a, an, a, an apt description to the role that NAFC plays? Uh, absolutely. I think it's a very good description and probably uh, some simple examples might help illustrate um, that in as much as we essentially aggregate the capability requirements from the, from the states and territories that so they um, tell us what capabilities they need and we can aggregate those and then approach the market with um, what you might call bulk procurement. Um, a number of jurisdictions need heavy helicopters, we can approach the market with the full picture of, of what, what's needed across the nation and potentially leverage the market in that sense. Um, or um, again, to use a simple example, the f uh, fire seasons in some jurisdictions are reasonably complementary. Um, Queensland, for example, more, you know, has been September to December, Tasmania, uh, December to to March, so um, potentially we can look at one aircraft service that covers the two seasons and, and offer the market um, uh, bulked up procurement in that sense. Um, the, one of the key purposes of doing that it, too is to facilitate the possibility then of sharing the resources between the jurisdiction. When you speak about um procuring services from the market. I just want to understand both sides, the supply and demand to that market. The demand is from state and territory agencies, and uh, but does it include other, including other agencies and or 
um, private sector interests? Um, no, the, the demand is from state and territory agencies. Um, there is um, some of the states and territories do have specific arrangements with um, private sector organisations like plantation companies and so on. Um, that's transparent to us. That kind of still comes through the, the appropriate state and territory agency. I see. And and in terms of the suppliers of aerial firefighting services, uh, are they all um, commercial operators? Uh, we, under the NAFSI arrangements, yes. Um, we go to appropriately qualified, experienced commercial operators. And currently, um, all the services are procured on what we'd call a full service basis or essentially a turnkey basis where we're supplying not just the aircraft but all the service elements that go around that aircraft, the maintenance and the fueling and the insurance and, and everything, yeah, and, and crew, of, crew too, of course, yeah. And those uh, commercial uh, suppliers, if I could use that, that language, are they purely domestic commercial suppliers or does they include international operators? Um, they, they are domestic uh, suppliers in the sense that one of our requirements is that they hold an Australian Air Operators Certificate mm -hmm. issued by CASA. Um, it, it would be fair to say that some international suppliers are still prominent in those arrangements, either through a subcontracting arrangement with a local supplier or uh, an international supplier may have a, a resident Australian um, or company. Now, um, there's, as I understand it, and please, please, if you could assist the commissioners, uh, there's a resource sharing arrangement, or sorry, a resource sharing agreement, which isn't the agreement as between the state and territory agencies, that is on the demand side, is that correct? That's correct, it's known as the resource management agreement. Resource management agreement, I see. And the Royal Wealth Management Agreement, um, Commissioners, that's behind tab 10, because the DOC ID AFC 5020011641 be brought up. Mr. Mr. Elder, what's going to happen is a document's going to come on the screen and hopefully you'll be able to see it. Uh, yes, I can see that. All right, so that's the Resource Management Agreement between the Australasian Fire and Emergency Service Authorities Council Limited, which I think um, Mr. Ellis referred to as AFAC Limited. Uh, and the parties listed in the schedule, I won't take you to it, but it's the um, Queensland, New South Wales, ACT, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia, Western Australia, Northern Territory um, party, other parties to that agreement. Yes, Does correct. The, yep. uh, the Commonwealth is not in any, um, in any way part of that agreement? Uh, no, that's correct. It's it's uh, an agreement between the states and territories and, and AFAC. Yep. All right. And then um, within that agreement, uh, um, it, as I understand, we're having raised this, uh, this notion of broker, that NAFCI enters into a, an agreement with the service provider, that is with the commercial operators, and then the state or territory then becomes the liable member for that particular service. Is that a fair summary of the way the contractual arrangements are? Uh, that, that's exactly right, yes. Um, and sometimes services are contracted through NAFCI on a shared basis, so that, for example, New South Wales and ACT might share a helicopter service. Um, that, that's correct. Um, mostly they're not contracted originally on a shared basis, but there are some examples of... Um, services that are contracted from, from the start on a shared basis. Um, certainly ACT in New South Wales do do that for some helicopters and uh, New South Wales and Victoria currently for some of the strategic mapping aircraft. Another, is there, has there ever been an occasion on which uh, services are contracted for all liable members, that is all members being the states and territories? Um, th there's been occasions when services um, have been fully funded um, by the Australian government through a funding contri contribution, but uh, the arrangement is still that one of the NAFSI members, one of the states and territories, will be the liable member 
um, and exercise what we call control over that resource. So just, just picking up on what you just said, uh, so you spoke about the Australian government, the Commonwealth government providing funding. So to fund the, um, the supply of that service, but that the, the, the particular state or territory has control over the utilisation of that service. Is that is that correct? Uh, yeah, just to clarify that um, the, the contribution from the Australian government, which comes through NEFSI, would be to the fixed costs of providing um, that particular aircraft or that particular service, um, not to the operating costs. I see. And Otherwise, it, yes. Is it possible just to give a sense to the commissioners what kind of proportion that is between the fixed costs and the operating costs? Contributions? Um, look, it, it's... Uh, Perhaps um, just to, to take a step back, if I could. Please. So all, all of the air, aircraft um, contracts uh, are funded by the, by the states and territories. Um, in the first instance, by so both the fixed costs and the operating costs, uh, and then the the Australian government makes a contribution via NAFSI towards the fixed costs um, of those those services. Um, in the past, the Australian government contribution has been a fixed amount. For the last 10 years or so, it's been um, around just under $15 million per annum. Um, whereas the, um, the amount that the states and territories um, contribute is highly variable depending on the nature of, of the season. Um, but uh, it, it would always be more than twice that and in some years um, would be considerably more than that. Um, and then uh, in the last uh, two years, the Australian government has made additional contributions, at, um, fixed contributions, recognising the nature of the, the particular season. Right. Just in relation to the supply side, um, are there standard contractual terms applying to all, all procurement through NASI? Uh, yes, yes, there is. Yes, um, and and what's the, name, a, uh, what's the I, I apologise, I've spoken over you, Mr. Ellis, Mr. Yeah. Um, Mr. Elder. Uh, what what's the standard term, and 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 how's that come about? So um, each contracted service is um, governed by quite a comprehensive contract arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, most. Of the contracts uh, contracted on what we call a three plus one plus one basis, so guaranteed three years of contract with options to extend for up to a further two years. Um, and essentially, what that means is that within each year of the contract, um, that uh, the operator, the commercial provider, is um, is required to provide the the, um, the service for a specific period of time that coincides normally with the fire season and in turn it's guaranteed to that operator that that service will be in place for that time and fixed charges paid accordingly. Um, the period of time does vary from uh, the period of time within the fire season does vary from contract to contract. Um, uh, we, we refer to that as the service period in each year of the contract. Um, uh, the sort of standard reference service period is, is 84 days, but we do have contracts that extend out to 152 days or longer. Um, and in some cases, a small number of contracts that provide uh, services year round. The, you spoke about the fire season. The fire season, um, as I understand it, is longer than 84 days. How, how do those contracts operate by reference to the start and end dates of the fire season? Yeah, um, so the the, um, the 80, 84 days, which is typical of a, con of a, of a contract, but not exclusive, um, is seen as the minimum period for which an aircraft might be engaged for the season, for a bushfire season. Um, it, so that balances, if you like, the financial risk of having a, a very quiet season and not having to pay for aircraft that aren't required. Um, but in it, every contract provides for that minimum period to be extended uh, should the season require that um, by giving the appropriate notice to the contractor. Um, and of course, in, some, in the case of some contracts, the, the minimum period is considerably 
considerably longer than that. Um, I referred earlier to the um, what we call the dovetail arrangements between Queensland and Tasmania, for example, where we're able to offer a service period of, uh, of um, 120 or 130 days potentially. Yep. Are you aware of any calls from uh, industry members, suppliers of these aerial firefighting services to, for there to be longer contracts uh, on offer? Uh, look, in two senses. Um, so the contract uh, period itself, meaning the, the length of the term of the contract, the three plus one plus one being our standard. Um, certainly I think there's interest from the industry in being able to have longer terms than, than the minimum guaranteed three years. Um, in as much as that potentially allows you know, investment um, in equipment. Um, some of these aircraft are very expensive, of course. Um, and uh, I think it's probably also fair to say that there's interest in the minimum service periods in each year of the contract um, being longer than they are currently. But in in that sense, it's a question of balancing available budget, financial risk, um, um, and, and having the, the flexibility to manage the level of resources up and down according to the nature of the season. In terms of identifying that question of what was the nature, of the, what will be the nature of the season, and, and uh, managing resources up and down as you've just described, what kind of information does do you and NAFSI um, utilise to help make those decisions? Look, they're, they're decisions of the state and territory agencies of the liable liable members. I see. We um, provide the contracting framework, but the decisions about when to commence the service period in each year of the contract, um, whether to extend the service period um, in any year of the contract are very much the decisions of the state and territories. I see. Now, based um, on their assessment of, of risk. Yep. I see. Uh, you, you referred, or there's referred to in uh, NAFSI's uh, submission to the Royal, uh, to the Royal Commission, um, the concept of call when needed arrangements. Could you just identify and explain what those are and, and how they fit within the framework we've just described? Yes, so the, the, the contract arrangements I've just been describing, um, we refer to them as the National Fleet arrangements, uh, the term, term contracts um, uh, that uh, are put in place about 155 aircraft services around the country. And if, if you like, they're the mainstay um, of uh, aerial firefighting in the country that the, for, the, for the use of the state and territory agencies. Some of those contracts do provide for additional resources to be added to the contract um, uh, should, they, should a state and territory um, be looking for additional resources in a, in a particular season. Um, so that, that would again be for a minimum service period on the same terms and conditions as the contract. And we do also maintain a small number of what we call secondary contracts, which are contracts, if you like, that um, we've, we've been through a process of assessing a, a particular operator and the service they provide, but the contract sits on the shelf um, uh, until a state and territory uh, agency says that they or indicates that they might be looking for additional resources for a, for a particular season, uh, in which case we would then provide that for a minimum service period in that season. I'm sorry, this is a slightly long-winded answer, so I'll get to the call we needed. Um, in addition to that, there are arrangements for ad hoc hire of aircraft services on what we call a call we needed basis where there's no guarantees to the operator of minimum period of engagement. Um, by the same token, um, there's no obligation of the service provider to, to respond um, to an offer of work. Um, in the past, those call when needed arrangements have actually been managed at state and territory level. Um, so each state and territory has had their own arrangement, probably akin to a panel contract arrangement where um, 
uh, and it varies a little bit according to the individual sort of purchasing requirements of the particular state and territory, but a, a process where an operator is uh, verified as meeting a minimum standard, um, they make their aircraft available for ad hoc engagement, um, and then, then if there's a need to supplement the contracted fleet of resources, they can be engaged directly. Uh, more recently, and just prior to 2019-20 season, um, the, the NFC Strategic Committee um, formed a view that we should try and standardise some of those core cool needed arrangements and bring them into a national framework. Um, so that process has commenced, um, but is um, we're currently sort of in, in, in a transition um, where we've entered into those all we needed panel contract type arrangements for some of the, the, the larger um, aircraft, but we're still relying on state and territory arrangements for the, for the smaller aircraft. Yep. So, so just in relation to those um, panel contracts and the, and the purchasing process, is there any? Um, is it right to say that it's it's the relevant state and territory um, procurement and probity uh, obligations that will be applicable, or is there some national or Commonwealth um, accountability or probity arrangement that sits over that procurement process? In terms of the the national fleet, the NAFSI core contracted arrangements with this um, series of um, Probity, um, so, so NEFSI has a probity arrangement, probity policy. All those, um, our, our probity standards are certainly aligned with the state territory um, uh, probity confidentiality and, and so on requirements. In fact, it's, it's really a case of um, maximum common denominator. We, we probably we need to be aligned to the highest standard um, and, and certainly do that. In terms of the core when needed arrangements that are still managed at state and territory level, then yes, it's the appropriate state and territory procurement rules and probity arrangements that would be in place. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke about a national strategy. Uh, was that is that a national? That's a national strategy that's still in development. Is that right? Uh, that that's uh, correct. Yes. So there is. Um, um, so there's just two, two separate um, things there. Apologies, Council, if I've um, confused the issue. So the, um, uh, there was a decision made to bring um, the call when needed contracting arrangements, the administration of the call when needed contracting arrangements, provide that in, an, in a national framework. Um, that's separate. Uh, process from the development of a national aerial firefighting strategy, which is another project, um, oh, a, a separate project. Yep. All right. Well, I better ask you about that second project um, so that I understand that project. Uh, what is that project and where is it up to? Um, so again, the, the, the strategic committee that governs NAFSI um, formed the view that it would be a useful thing to do to develop a, a national aerial firefighting strategy. And I think it's fair, fair to say that um, you know, previously the strategic use of aerial firefighting, it's a matter for state and territory authorities, but we're mature enough now in the collab collaborative and, and cooperative arrangements between the states and territories to have a, an overarching um, national strategy that particularly looks at how we leverage the sort of national cooperation and collaboration into the future. Um, that um, process is still in its in its infancy. It really only commenced a, a, a couple of months ago. Um, and um, you know, we're in, in the process of producing some draft material for the states and territories to respond to. At the end of the day, it'll be a strategy that's agreed by the states and territories. Uh, again, we're providing a sort of facilitating process for that. Um, there's a number of objectives, um, but one objective is to project our, our capability requirements into the future. So as part of that process of developing that strategy, we've, we've gone to the states and territories to, to get their views on what they think their capability requirements will be into the future. Um, they're still in the process of responding to that. 
um, that would then to enable us to project those to the market so that we can ensure that the market um, is geared to provide to those capabilities rather than being driven by what's just available on the market. Um, and it would also look at the options for how those capabilities should be provided. I mean, we currently source the, the, the capabilities on that full service basis that I described. Um, that's been a very good model up to date, but um, it doesn't have to be the model going forward. If there's better models uh, going forward, then we certainly uh, would see that we'd, we'd analyse those and adopt them if, if appropriate. Um, just in your description of the uh, National Aerial Firefighting Strategy uh, and the way it's being developed and the feedback of views, you didn't mention the Commonwealth. Does the Commonwealth uh, have is the Commonwealth having any role in relation to the development of this strategy? Uh, certainly, I expect we would consult with the Commonwealth through the through EMA, in as much as the Commonwealth is a funding provider uh, to that. I think um, uh, we would get a draft of the strategy and, and assess the capability requirements um, from the states and territories, um, get, get those documented and assembled probably before we uh, and we'd then take that to the Commonwealth in a consultative way, yes. I see. So, that, so EMA is not having any role in the development of this strategy, it'll only be after it's been internally I looked at that, that's, is that right? Um, I think as I say, it's very much in its infancy at the moment. Um, we've certainly indicated to EMA that this um, is in process. Um, and my understanding is that if anecdotally and informally, uh, that process is supported. Um, it's just a little bit early to take it uh, to EMA. We probably need to give them something to actually respond to. Um, but we would certainly um, take their views into account, or states and territories that certainly take their views into account in terms of developing a final document. I'd be sure of that. Yep. So this this activity is that you've described is that um, is that taking place under the aegis of the Na of the um, NAFSI strategy committee? Is that right? The, the NAFSI strategic committee. committee. That's correct. Right. But correct. Yes. what relationship does that committee have with the commissioners and chief? Officers Strategic Committee, COSC? Um, look, in effect, it, it um, plays a parallel role to COSC in some respects in that it provides the governance of the NAFSI arrangements. But um, as you might expect, uh, a number of the members of the NAFSI Strategic Committee are common to both COSC and the NAFSI Strategic Committee. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's a current and constant sort of interaction um, between the two. How, how does, uh, and, and maybe you might answer by reference to the current, the recent bushfire season, how does NAFSI in its brokering role deal with the uh, issue or problem of needing to source a surge capacity? That is, if the fire season or as um, some other natural disaster occurs, for example, a cyclone, there's some sort of change in the operating environment. How does, how is that, that taken into account in the, in the, um, both at the procurement level and then at the sort of strategic procurement level, if I might put it that way? Yep. So in the, in the first instance, uh, just to be clear, we, we rely on the states and territories to identify the capabilities uh, that are needed. We don't make decisions about the capabilities that are needed to respond to, to risk. That's, that very much sits with the, with the members' agencies, um, both in a, a short, medium and, and longer term sense. Um, so our, our role is to, to support them and if they require resources to assist them in providing those resources. Um, uh, so we do that through that national contracting framework. There's a degree of flexibility built into that um, national contracting framework in terms of the ability to procure additional or extra resources, um, including at relatively short notice if that's appropriate. Uh, and then moving into the call when needed um, area to provide that extra surge capacity should additional resources be required. 
We spoke earlier about um, international uh, procuring international services. Uh, is there any kind of either at state or territory level or a national level um, a, a, a buy Australia first policy, so to speak? Um, look, look, not not explicitly as such, but we do expect, and in fact, this is stated in our in the documentation of our various uh, tender processes and proposals process, that we would expect that Australian-based organisations would be able to demonstrate advantages in the supply of the service in, in that they have uh, local support, um, local capability and local capacity. But is there a definitive um, uh, percentage or something like that applied? The answer answer is no, but certainly we expect locally based um, suppliers to be able to demonstrate advantages in, in the assessment of tenders and the assessment of proposals. Uh, and in relation to the national strategy that's being identified, is, is, is it contemplated that that will include um, any principles or criteria about prioritisation of procurement or prioritisation of the, of the um, sharing of aerial firefighting resources? Uh, in terms of prioritisation between the jurisdictions? Yes. Um, look, not, not as such. Um, that's um, not really the, the, the role of, this, of that strategy. Um, but uh, I would expect that one of the options that might be canvassed in the development of the strategy would be the concept of um, providing some resources on a, on a national basis rather than belonging to individual jurisdictions as such. Because mm -hmm. um, that, that might provide some additional flexibility. And I'm not saying that will happen, but I expect it's an option that'll be canvassed and assessed in the development of the strategy. We um, may or may not end up promoting that, but if it did happen, then clearly there'd need to be um, processes that go into place to decide the, the um, priority allocation of those resources if they were to be sort of procured on a more national basis, yes. So I've spoken about the sort of procurement contracts piece and then there's the question of operational deployment. Uh, the um, arena, if, if you could just I identify for the commissioners um, what, are, what arena is and, and in particular, how does it deal with deploying uh, aerial assets and, and if at all, facilitating their prioritisation as between different jurisdictions. Sure. So, um, again, just to take a little step back, if I might, um, the um, uh, some of the things that, that NASI does to support the members are this collaborative procurement approach, um, also the um, the facilitation of, of resource sharing, um, the provision of support systems on a collaborative basis, and ARENA is an example of that that will come, come back to, and also um, standardisation and standardisation um, from two perspectives, one to get best practice in, in aerial firefighting, but also it underpins um, resource sharing. Um, obviously, too, to be able to share resources effectively across borders, they need to, to operate to a standard or be provided to a standard. So on those support systems, um, the ARENA system is a good example of that. So the ARENA system is a web-based information system that has been implemented on a national basis, uh, collaboratively developed by, by NAFSI with the member agencies. Um, it's a web-based system uh, that all the agencies have access to, varying levels of access, of course, managed levels of access. Uh, essentially, uh, it's built around a registry of all the aircraft that might be used for firefighting, um, all the uh, operators, all the crew that support those um, aircraft, the pilots and so on, contains all the, the details of all those assets and people and companies. Uh, and then around that registry is a whole range of extra functionality. Um, I won't attempt to describe it in, in detail now, but I think probably the, the piece of functionality you're most interested in would be what we call the dispatch um, component. Yes. Where, which the um, 
um, the agencies, the state agencies use to um, actually send the, to task the aircraft to, um, to particular, to, to jobs, to tasks. Um, it, it's, it's essentially a tool that assists uh, the agencies or provides the agencies with quality information to make their decisions on, on dispatch. Um, quality and consistent information um, and provide some tools to help with the dispatch decisions. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the state and territory agencies actually make the decisions to, to dispatch. NAFSI itself doesn't play a role in that. And likewise, when it comes to sharing uh, the resources, it's the state and territory agencies, the liable members that make those decisions. But ARENA certainly help, helps them make those decisions and in particular um, provides national visibility of where the resources are and, and what their current engagement is. And I probably should add to that, one, one of the inputs to ARENA is, is a tracking system, a national tracking system. So all the aircraft that we use in firefighting are tracked um, in real time using satellite tracking system. Okay. So we have, you know, good good visibility at any point in time about where the resources are and what their status is. And that's that's available to all, all the um, agencies. Just one moment, Mr Alder, if you would. Commissioners, I note the time. I only have a few more questions with, with Mr Alder and then, of course, your questions. And he did wait this morning to come on. No, I think uh, we'll continue Please. on and we'll finish this up. We'll have a couple of questions. Uh, before the end of it. All right. Ms Dalda, what we propose to do is try and complete your evidence so you don't need to dial off and dial back on. That's fine. Uh, whatever suits the Commission. Thank you. Um, you were talking about dispatch just a moment ago. Um, what, if any, relevance does the concept of predetermined dispatch have to the operation of ARENA and the operation of aerial firefighting? Um, so I think um, it's, it's probably fair to say that research and experience you know, supports the notion that the best, one of the best uses of aircraft, I'd probably say the best use of aircraft is early in the life of an incident and that minimising response times um, is one of the best things we can do to, to maximise the, to optimise the effectiveness of aerial response. Um, now that implies quite a few things. It implies having the fleet um, or the aircraft well dispersed uh, around the country so the, the distances are minimised. It implies contract arrangements that have them ready to respond um, and minimising the time between um, you know the need for an aircraft and it responding to that incident. Now, some, some states have put in various, um, have implemented various iterations of predetermined dispatch or automatic dispatch where um, under certain predetermined conditions, um, a fire risk or fire danger, um, an aircraft will be dispatched to the out outbreak of a fire effectively automatically without um, in intervention. Um, uh, so if fire is reported, the aircraft goes automatically, um, and if it turns out it's not needed, it's it's turned around. Um, so Western Australia, South Australia, Victoria all, all, all have some form of predetermined dispatch like that, probably fair to say. I think South Australia um, led Australia, if not the world, in putting that sort of system in, in place originally in the Adelaide, Adelaide Hills. Um, uh, ARENA does assist with that process in that the dispatches can be automatically recorded in ARENA, again just providing the visibility of what's actually happened. Um, so depending on the particular system that the state agency uses, they might use a pager system that pages the pilot to, to head, um, uh, then, then ARENA can, can bring those pager messages in automatically, although I have to say we're actually finding that functionality at the moment, um, or potentially it can send a dispatch message to the aircraft in a, in a range of other ways, whether it's by uh, an email or something like that. Um, Mr. Mr. The um, other thing... Oh, sorry. 
sorry, it might have been a bit too much detail. Or <laughs> no, Mr. Alder, what I was going to what I was going to do, and but but please can complete your answer. I was what just so that I can assist you to assist the commissioners. Um, I was going to ask. You've spoken about some capabilities um, with an arena, uh, and what I was going to ask you if you could identify to the commissioners uh, whether the following capabilities are part of arena, and if not, whether there's some proposal. Uh, to um, improve or expand arena um, in that sure. regard. The first is, um, does it presently inc include um, real-time incident reporting? Uh, in, in, in incidents uh, involving aircraft, like yes. accidents and incidents? Yes, yes. so not, not um, the incidents not to which they're attending, but an incident involving, for yep. example, a safety or an accident involving the dispatched aircraft. Um, it, it, it does provide a facility to do that, but we are very um, uh, conscious of the need to improve that particular piece of functionality, and that is planned um, planned works to happen before the next fire season. Mm -hmm. um, in as much as it provides, currently provides a sort of text-based repository, but doesn't necessarily provide tools that you can use to analyse and, and understand the data in a, or patterns in the data. Yep. Um, does it capture distress signals and pass them on? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, um, yeah. And is there a proposal for that to be incorporated in some way? Um, I think cur currently there, there isn't um, a proposal. The, um, the tracking system can accommodate um, the tracking system is a, is a separate system that feeds data into ARENA. Uh, it can accommodate um, distress signals, but um, it, it in turn relies on data from a whole from a number of different tracking providers. It's agnostic to the to the various commercial tracking providers, uh, and the concept of including a reliable um, uh, treatment of distress signals coming through that system would be something that um, would have to be looked at in some detail from a from a technical and operational perspective. In terms of the uh, uh, identifying a national perspective to these matters, um, do, does the has does NAFC um, uh, have any liaison with uh, or any input into the work of the? Um, the ATSB or CASA, so the, the Commonwealth authorities, in relation to safety and safety management uh, systems or standards for operating uh, procedures? Um, look, not in a formal sense. I like to think we have a good relationship with both those organisations and we certainly um, communicate um, regularly with those with those organisations. Um, and I can I take the, some license here and take the opportunity to acknowledge um, the assistance of both of those organisations provided um, particularly over over the, um, the last season and in CASA in particular with processing uh, approvals and uh, for, for additional resources at, at short notice. Um, I mean we do rely on the CASA systems for safety assurance in the normal Legislative way and into you know exercising their legislative responsibilities, um, but that's that's not to say there aren't other systems that we could put in place to uh, support that and and um, bolster that. But um, uh, certainly, and then and, and that's you know something that we'd be pleased to discuss with with CASA going forward. Just, just two last questions because I, I know at the time and the commissioners do have questions. Just on the national coordination piece, um, does, does NAFSI have any role in a circumstance where a state has control of the resource as a liable member but another state needs it? Who makes the decision in those circumstances as to whether or not uh, it's, it's kept within one state or moved across? Does NAFSI have a role? Um, no, NEFSI's only role in, in that sense is to assist in identifying um, where resources might be made available and connecting that with a state that might have a requirement for the resource. But at the end of the day, the, the decision, um, uh, in, in a similar way as 
described as the National Resource Centre is made by the relevant chief or commissioner of the particular jurisdiction that has control. Right. And does that extend to, for example, the retasking of an aerial asset from one jurisdiction to another because, say, something develops in the course of the day or the, ne the next day? Yes, yes, it does. Yep. Commissioners? Thank you, Council Assisting. Um, I have a couple of questions. Just one in the process, uh, Mr Alder. We'll go back to the capability requirements uh, leading into a, into a season. From what you've said, and please just fill in the, the, the blanks, the states come individually develop their capability requirements for that, that year, that season that, that, that's coming up. That gets collated uh, at NAFC and then you look to go out and contract those capabilities required for the states or broker those contracts so that the states can then contract, is that right? Uh, in essence, Commissioner, yes, although um, it happens on a um, short, medium and longer term basis, given that um, most of the contracts are three to five years, we actually ask the states and territories to project three to five years ahead. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the core capabilities um, and and then yes we assemble those um, um, that, that might involve a bit of uh, if I can use the unscientific term a bit of horse trading um, between jurisdictions um, where we, we, we may say um, you've indicated that you're looking for a type one helicopter at this location but um, we think if you know we went to the market, we might be able to get a better deal on two type two helicopters or something like yeah. that. Uh, that jurisdiction will say, um, yes, that's a good idea, or they might say, no, 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 we we really want a type one helicopter there. I assume it's that not not all contracts are running together in a three year plus one plus one. There must be a stagger of those contracts as you come up for a renewal. That, that, that is correct, although um, about two-thirds of the contracts are on a, on a, um, a synchronised cycle. Cycle. So, okay. Um, yep, yep. So if they ever noting you know, that the, the seasons go up and down depending on the, 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 uh, the climate predictions and the, the weather predictions as you get close to the, the season, is it about a mid-year point that you look at the coming season and look to ensure that the capabilities that are required or are being requested by the states are being fulfilled? Uh, look, uh, ideally earlier than, than mid-year, um, um, in as much as the Northern Territory season, for example, is usually commenced um, you know, by, by late June or early July. So. Um, you know, we'd certainly looking be looking to the Northern Territory, and, th and that this has happened much, much earlier than that. Um, and in, if it's a, a, a capability that requires you know, some of the more sophisticated resources, um, even earlier than that, again, because uh, you know the, the tender processes need to be initiated um, early. Yep. Okay. Have there been any years where? the collated requirements of the states as they've come up in a capability sense have not been able to be met? Um, I think the short answer is not that, that I'm aware of. So the, 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 the capability requirements that the states and territories indicate to us on that sort of three to five year cycle um, form the core um, of the fleet and then we as I say, depending on the seasonal conditions, we can supplement that with additional aircraft on those contracts or the use of our secondary contracts, the off-the-shelf contracts, and then potentially with call when needed um, arrangements. Um, I think between those arrangements, we've normally been able to provide the capability requirements that the states and territories um, are seeking. Um, it would probably be fair to say, of course, we don't necessarily know when what they haven't asked for because they they didn't they were aware that we might not have been able to provide or the market might not have been able to provide. But that certainly, to the best of my knowledge, we've uh, met met the requirements. Yep. Okay. So in that sense, then, are the capabilities that you are given to fill determined by the conditions that are coming up, or are they capped by? knowledge of the available market or you only have this much money? 
look, they're really decisions for the for the states and territories. So the, that 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 core fleet um, forms the basis um, of the fleet. It can be um, supplemented um, when it is supplemented. Yes, the state, the relevant state and territory needs to find the budget to do that. Um, uh, so that's a decision that they'll 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 make. Um, in terms of states and territories not asking for capabilities because they're aware or they think they might not be available, I mean, we'd certainly hope that they would come to us at least to explore that in the first mm -hmm. instance. So, yeah, I think if there is resources in that category, it'd be relatively minor. Yep. Okay. So, so as far as you're aware, for the for the last few fire seasons up until 19, the 2019-2020, the capability requirements that were foreshadowed have been filled prior to the, the, the season start. As far as I'm aware, yes. Okay, no, I pre appreciate that. Thank, thank you. Um, talking about a, a potential national contribution, from what you described is uh, Commonwealth funding gets distributed through the, the contracting and the resources come in under one of the state jurisdictions and are operated that way. If the Commonwealth was to fund a national capability, does the current framework allow that to be employed or would that have to be changed? Uh, no, look, I think it um, would be fair. To, uh, I think we could say that the current framework would allow that. Um, it would require a little bit of um, uh, evolution, I think, but it's a well now proven, tested um, arrangement if we were to have some capabilities that didn't belong to a particular state, it, it, it would need to um, some some evolution to make sure we had the proper processes in place to allocate those resources. Mm -hmm. But I'd suggest that that evolution would happen now through the the same arrangements that are evolving for ground resources, if you like, um, through the NRSC and the COSC arrangements. Okay. Thank you. And one final question from me. The arena system, just confirm, or not, as the case may be, each jurisdiction can see what activity is going on in the other jurisdiction. So one jurisdiction, if they needed assets, they could look across and see where other assets in another jurisdiction might be based or operating at the at the time. Are there any limitations on that? Uh, no, that, that can certainly happen. Obviously, there's levels of access. Um, that are managed according to the, the role that a particular person or a particular, um, so the role that a person might be undertaking in their jurisdiction and the level of access provides, you know, um, increased access to the information. Not all people could see pricing information, for example, mm -hmm. because some of that's confidential, commercial in confidence. But, but in a general sense, yeah, absolutely, it provides national visibility of, of uh, availability of resources uh, and commitment of resources. Okay. You know, I wasn't thinking on the contract. You know, I was thinking more around the operational yep. side, of the actual employment. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, answering those questions. Commissioner McIntosh. Just got one. Um, could I pull up AFC 5020010017? Second last para. Um, uh, no, one down. In that second sen oh, third sentence there, you've said that Queensland, New South Wales, ACT, Victoria and Tasmania are using the arena's contract management and aircraft dispatch functions. Is there any reason why, or can you talk to the reasons why some of the other jurisdictions aren't using that functionality um, and particularly the aircraft dispatch functions? Uh, Commissioner, it's really um, the, the dispatch function has only been in place for now two seasons. Um, and uh, for some of the smaller jurisdictions, it's probably been, um, I'll put it in a clunky way, less incentive, I suppose, to, to move from there existing systems. Um, in smaller jurisdictions, their, their existing systems um, are ad adequate for, for, their, um, for their current needs. Um, but uh, we would certainly be encouraging them to all transition across to using the, um, 
arena aircraft dispatch functions because then that does um, uh, provide us with other data um, that can be used um, you know subsequently because arena does keep all the data um, all the dispatches all the tracking data um, and then we can use that later on or the jurisdictions can use that later on to you know analyze operations to, to look at um, response times as an example um, uh, there's, a, there's a whole range of reporting that arena can potentially do um, that, that would assist the jurisdictions but, and if all jurisdictions were using the dispatch function we could um, have that on a national basis as well but Thanks very uh, much. At this stage, it's really, yeah, really just a question of time to transition. Thanks very much. Thank you for that, Commissioner Bennett. Uh, thank you. Um, I just have one one question. Um, in your in the notice that you've referred a couple of times in your notice to give to the issues around the different tactical radio communication systems in the different states and territories, I was just wondering if you could comment on whether that influences the um, the work of NAFC and your views on how that impacts on um, availability of resources and the ability to do the um, dispatches across jurisdictions. Um, sure. Does it impact on the work of NAFC in as much as um, NAFC attempts to, to broker agreement on, on national standards and standard approaches to the um, to the aircraft resources and the use of aircraft, then, then yes, um, we certainly aim to, to standardise that as much as, as is appropriate. Um, uh, then when it comes to actually moving aircraft um, across jurisdictional boundaries, it's certainly um, something that does need to be taken into account. So our contracts require that the aircraft be fitted, contracted aircraft be fitted with the, the tactical radio system of the jurisdiction in which they're based. Um, <clears throat> normally that actually involves two physical radio units. Um, so if there's a need to move that aircraft to another jurisdiction, then there's a need to either ch you know change the radio or come up with um, some other workaround. And, um, while that's heading into a sort of operational territory that really the states and territories are responsible for, we're certainly aware that that can uh, frustrate, for, <clears throat> excuse me, frustrate for want of a better word, moving um, aircraft across um, borders and sharing aircraft across borders, yes. Sorry, just one follow on one, because you said, I, think, I thought you said earlier you try and standardise it as much as possible. How can you standardise it if, there are, if they've got different standards? I can just explain what you meant by that. Um, yes, yeah, so um, um, the, I mean, the the radio systems, the tactical radio systems, though, as distinct from the aeronautical radio systems, which are all also installed in the aircraft, um, the, the tactical radio systems manage at a state and territory level. Um, I mean, speaking frankly, it's we can't standardise that currently because each state and territory. Um, adopts a, a different system um, that are largely uh, incompatible. So we standardise to the extent of saying, you know, um, the numbers of radios and the, the fact that the aircraft will be equipped with the tactical system of the state and territory that they're based. But in terms of the, the standardisation of the actual system, currently that's impractical. Thank you very much. And thank you for your assistance too. Thanks, Mr. Alder. We appreciate your, your time this afternoon. Ms. Hogan Doran. Uh, just one question, just a clarification, just to assist Mr. Alder. When you said number of radios, um, how many, this is tactical radios, um, what number is set and why? Um, so, contracted aircraft are normally required to carry um, two aeronautical radios and two tactical radios. Um, the agency radios, and that's to provide the ability. Most most states and territories, there's slight variations between all of them, operate some form of trunk or cellular type system, and it's necessary to have um, radios that can, can communicate on 
that system while also having a radio that can undertake the local communications, simplex um, type communications. Just to emphasise though that um, there's no expectation that a pilot would be expected to use all four radios <laughs> at a particular point in time. Um, it's well established that really the maximum that you can expect a, a crew to manage is two radios at any point in time. So uh, the communications planning around response and incidents does need to take that into account um, and, and does take that into account. Um, so that the pilot would only be expected to monitor and utilise two radios at any any one point in time. Thank you. Sir. Um, and if the sorry, if the aircraft is capable of having more radios fitted, um, then we don't uh, we, we encourage that. So, you know, an, an aircraft based in southern New South Wales, for example, if they're able to accommodate the Victorian agency radios, for argument's sake, because it's likely that it goes across the border, then. Um, we, we encourage that, but it can't be achieved practically in all circumstances. Does that, does that, just one last question, does that affect the dispatch or the choice of aerial asset that is dispatched? So that if, for example, um, the aerial asset does not have a pre-fitted radio which would enable it to safely go in across the border, to another jurisdiction, it wouldn't be chosen to be dispatched and perhaps an aerial asset from a distance further away would be preferred? Uh, that, that, that is a possible scenario, yes, or um, a, what we'd call a workaround um, scenario where um, <coughs> the, the closer aircraft might still be dispatched but then a, a locally based aircraft in the receiving jurisdiction would also be activated um, to provide supervision of that aircraft and the communications with the ground crews, then the two aircraft communicate on an, on the aeronautical frequencies, which is a, a standardised national approach. So that the, there are workarounds for that situation, but certainly it, it, it could happen that um, it affects the choice of aircraft to dispatch, yes. All right. Thank you, Mr Alder. Commissioner, I don't have any further questions. Do we have any questions from afar? Uh, we'll just pause for a moment and I'll just okay. confer to determine. We hadn't had any notified, but... No? No. Not at this point. Mr Alder, thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Commissioners. Oh, yes, might Mr Alder be excused? Yes, he can be excused. Thank you. Thank you. I propose to deal with the tender of materials if it's convenient after the luncheon break. That's okay. Well, uh, how long do you need the adjournment for? 60 um, minutes? I think we've uh, arranged for the next group of witnesses for 2.15. Okay. So I'm being suggested it's 2 p.m. Uh, 2 p.m. No, we might adjourn till 14.15, uh, so 2.15. 2.15. Thank you, yeah, We'll take that adjournment. Thank you. All rise.
the Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Ms. Hogan Doran. Our commissioners, I call Ruth Ryan. Ms. Ryan, welcome this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, commissioners. Ms. Ryan, do you take an oath or affirmation? Ms. Ryan, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Now, Ms. Ryan, I didn't actually hear your answer then. Could you repeat that for the purpose of the transcript? I do. Yes. Right. Um, we'll just keep an eye on the quality of the audio as uh, I ask you questions. Um, could you uh, tell the commissioners what your role is in relation to um, Hancock Victorian Plantations Proprietary Limited? Yes, I'm the HVP Corporate Fire Manager. Um, I manage our fire response and fire management right across the state um, in our company. And, and what is your company? What's Hancock, or HVP as you called it, but the full name as I understand it is Hancock Victorian Plantations? Yes, it's Hancock Victorian Plantations Proprietary Limited. We are a plantation grower within the state of Victoria. We have um, around about uh, 237,000 hectares of land which we manage. And of that, around about 180,000 hectares is plantation which uh, supplies the timber into various local mills, things like saw, um, saw logs and uh, pulp and paper um, and uh, construction products right um, in uh, Victoria, New South Wales and uh, South Australia. And how long have you been the corporate fire manager with HVP? I've been the corporate fire manager since 2011 with HVP. And what's your background that you bring to that role? I have a, a Bachelor of Forest Science from the University of Melbourne. Um, I'm also a registered forestry professional with specialist peer-reviewed skills in fire management and plantation management. And I have around about 40 years as a forest fire fighter. I've been captain of three forest industry brigades and I have been awarded an Australian Fire Services Medal. So uh, HVP, if I may call, you, call it that, HVP has provided a response to a notice to give information which is at RRY 500.001001. Did you have a role in preparing that um, that uh, response by the company? I did. I, I prepared that response. All right. And could we have that um, proposed attend to that response, commissioners? So we will uh, take that document as a exhibit as marked. Okay. In your role as Corporate Fire Manager, what does that role involve for HVP? I manage all of our uh, fire management and response, so it's uh, looking at the risk through our assets from, from bushfire. Um, it's also part of our response is that we have seven forest industry brigades underneath the CFA Act within Victoria, uh, and so I manage the uh, and coordinate the, the uh, response and role of those brigades. And does HVP have its own aerial assets? That is either that it either owns or operates or uh, leases? Yes, we lease two aircraft each year, which we put on standby for 10 weeks. These aircraft are leased under the um, an arrangement with the state air unit, which is uh, part of the Department of Environment uh, Planning, Land and Water, and um, it's they're obtained through the NAFSI um, uh, tender process. So, just so I clarify that, um, so you, 
HVP, does it have a direct relationship with NAFSI in that tender process? No, it's indirect. We have a, um, an agreement with the DELP, uh, as I may refer to them, mm -hmm. um, to supply aviation resources. Uh, and this uh, is a three-year agreement with, which has been extended um, on a one plus one basis as well. And do you, you, you've spoken about having placing two aircraft on fire standby for a period of 10 weeks during the fire season. Are there any other um, aerial assets or um, firefighting assets that HVP uh, brings to bear during the fire season? Yes, we have uh, 20 tankers, um, around about uh, 280 uh, personnel that we can call on, qualified firefighters and um, support staff, um, and another 57 small quick attack units as well. So in relation to the 2019-2020 bushfire season, were the HVP plantations, the actual plantations, um, fire affected? Yes, we lost um, plantation in three different areas, uh, a total of uh, around about uh, 6,300 hectares uh, of plantation was burned. And did those, uh, do you know how those um, um, fires were ignited? Were they ignited within the plantation footprint or was it uh, outside the plantations? All of the fires came from outside the plantations. We had, uh, I think one was potentially caused by a campfire and I believe the other two were probably lightning strikes. I see. So um, there's a photograph that's um, set out in the submission. If we could just go to RRY 500 001 0004. What can we see uh, in this photograph? This photograph is of a plantation burning in southwest Victoria. It is the Way Junction fire. Mm -hmm. It's a, taken approximately one and a half hours after the fire had started. It's um, actually burning in another plantation growers plantation at that stage, but our plantation is just to the north of that. And, and how was um, that fire brought under control, or was it brought under control? Yes, it was eventually brought under control, um, total area of just under 800 hectares. It was um, largely the ground resources that brought it under control, but it was supported significantly by the state air resources. Um, that included um, four uh, single-engine air tractor uh, type um, fire bombers. There was two helicopters and uh, two large air tankers that worked on that over the first couple of days. Was the uh, there's quite a lot of smoke in that in that photograph? Was did the smoke, to your knowledge, affect the five uh, aerial firefighting? Fi I'll draw that. Did the smoke affect the aerial firefighting capability? Yes, it does. It, it um, obstructs the the aircraft from actually getting to the seat of the the, uh, the flames. Uh, it's very difficult to get into that the front of that, um, and so probably most of the operations in this um, were done on the flanks of these fires rather than than near the head fire. The, in your uh, in HVP submission speaks to some of the um, uh, advantages of um, aerial uh, firefighting over ground suppression resources. Um, you speak. Uh, we just go to um, 0003 under question two, um, just to capture that. We're just under two. Thank you. Um, you were asked a question concerning how effective was the use of the assets during the course of the um, deployment of the aerial firefighting, and you make it's made, the observation is made that. Um, 
uh, without ground crews, tankers and bulldozers, aircraft are limited in what they achieve. What you've just described to the commissioners does suggest that there's a, there needs to be interaction between the aerial and the, and the um, ground crews, or are they able to operate entirely independently? No, there definitely needs to be that interaction between the aerial and ground crew. You can effectively fight a fire without aircraft, but it is more difficult. But you can't really fight a fire without ground crews there. Uh, you effectively bring it under control and make sure it's out and it's not going to escape. You really need the ground crews there. And it needs to be coordinated between um, what's happening from the air and also what's happening on the ground. How does that coordination take place, to your knowledge? The, what normally happens is that the um, officer in charge on the ground has um, communications with uh, a person in this, this normally, as well as the uh, fire bombing aircraft, there's normally what they call an air attack supervisor. And so the person that's in charge on the ground is um, communicating with the aerial attack supervisor about where they're going to um, uh, drop their loads and and what's going to be most effective in the firefight, and also making sure that uh, um, the people on the, on the ground are also safe from the fire bombing as well. Just before we, um, I want to explore that a little bit further with you. But before we pass from this page, you've made, identified three major advantages: speed, access, and observation. Um, could you just explain, um, uh, does that affect the choice, the choice of the type of aerial asset, uh, either within the, the body of aerial assets or as against ground forces? It, yes, it does. Um, the, the, there are quite a variety of um, options that we've got with um, aero firefighting. So you can have what they call seats, which is the single air, um, single engine air tr anchors. Um, so they're the small planes, they're like the um, uh, um, aerial super spreaders, fertiliser. Um, they, they have around about 3,200 litres of retardant. Um, the big advantage of them is that they can take off from a local strip. So in this instance, uh, there was four of those um, based locally at, um, two at Casterton and two at uh, Hamilton. And, um, and so they're, they're very quick response. You can have them scattered throughout the state. Whereas the large air tankers, um, you know, their turnaround time was about an hour and a half, a much larger volume, but you can often get as much out of the small air tankers as you can out of the, uh, the large ones. Um, and then you've also got helicopter resources as well that um, can be very, you know, in, in this circumstance, they had about a five minute um, turnaround between filling up and, and dropping their load. Um, what are some of the issues in coordinating issue? assets on fire event days? The, of course, all of our assets are, are limited. Um, we can't just have unlimited assets. And so therefore you've got to um, prioritise your assets to the, you know, the, the fires that we've got going is, is generally the, the um, situation. But, you know, you might end up with uh, assets that are taken to another part of the state or um, fire priorities. And uh, so that, uh, you know, it's, it's about being, being effective in your coordination and making sure that the right fires get prioritised. Just, just on that, um, it, it may be that I've, um, I, I hadn't appreciated part of your evidence. Um, when HVP makes available or puts on standby to the two aerial assets that you spoke about at the beginning. Is that just for HVP's own uh, own property interests or or are you sort of inserted into the overall state response? We're actually inserted into the overall state response, but in, um, in saying that, we have first priority over those, those assets and Unless we release them, then they won't um, be released to any other um, fires outside of what we would see as our priority. 
Right. And and but, how? Uh, but that's what it's like. I beg your pardon. I didn't. That's part of our relationship with the the state is that we we do release them. I see. And and um, how are. Uh, how is the – no, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, some of the other coordination issues, if we just bring up page uh, 0008 and under paragraph C. You've already mentioned that it, to affect the first dot point about the need for coordination with between aerial and ground firefighting um, personnel and the strategies that they're they're employing, uh, and also what I, what I wanted to raise with you is the, the second matter, which was about who's directing the aerial attack. Um, in your experience, how does how does that work um, for HVP? Is it does, does HVP have a role in directing the aerial attack? It's, it it um, yes. We do. Um, say, for instance, in, the, in a, the first instance where we dispatch a helicopter out to um, a fire that we're interested in, and that's the only only aircraft that is attending that fire, then um, our operations officer on the ground will be the person that will direct where the priorities for that helicopter is. Um, if that fire then scales up, then the, um, there would be other aircraft brought in and an aerial attack supervisor then would be the um, person that would coordinate all of those aerial assets. We heard some evidence uh, before the uh, luncheon adjournment about the ARENA system uh, and uh, its role in relation to the dispatch and tracking of aircraft that are involved in aerial firefighting. Does HPV's assets appear on and use the ARENA system? Yes, our assets are integrated within ARENA. Um, and so that gives us also, well, we have access to ARENA and it gives us an idea of where all of the rest of the assets, you know, whether they're deployed or whether they're, they're at their home base. And so that also is a factor that we take into account um, with our asset. And, and is that real-time access? It is, yes. Um, the, there's a slight delay. I'm just about to start to apologise. Thank you. The arena system, um, are you, have you identified or has HVP identified any ways in which that might be um, improved in a way that might benefit um, property holders and, and, and others uh, who are facing fires that uh, are going to be um, for using aerial assets? Yes, um, it, Arena is, is pretty much new on the block and so we're only really just this year starting to explore its capabilities. Um, but I was in communication with uh, people in NATSI the other day and, and just um, one of the, the ways I thought it could be improved would be to um, be able to uh, select a, an area on the map and then get all of the data for any um, aircraft that was flying within that map. There's the, you can see it on the um, on the live screen, but this is going back and looking at it retrospectively. I see. The um, were there any mishaps during the course of uh, the bushfire season for the aerial assets that were being used for defending the HVP plantations? Not that I know. No. Okay. Um, were there ever? Were, do, were there other? Um, it, sorry. In your in your response, you referred to the um, use of uh, specialist plantation firefighters, uh, and also those from interstate and from overseas. Could you just explain how that how that um, how that came about and and. Um, describe to the commissioners something about that um, utilisation of those uh, resources? Yes, we have, um, within our 
forest industry brigades in, within Victoria, we have, um, they're all trained to CFA standards and that includes a unit of plantation firefighting. And because our people are working in the plantation, they get to know the fuel types, they get to know the, um, the you know, how fire behaves in the plantation, which is slightly different to to native forest. Um, and and so um, these people become skilled in, in what we call plantation firefighting. Um, we also have an association with a number of other companies um, within Australia and overseas. Um, we have a very strong association with a group called the Forest Owners Conference, which is in um, the border between South Australia and Victoria. Uh, and that essentially is other plantation growers. So we actually coordinate our response between all of those plantation growers. When we need additional resources, especially for these campaign fires, then we can also call on the other resources, um, such as with HQP in Queensland and also um, another company in, in Zealand that is associated with our company. Uh, and again, they're, they're people that are experienced in, in plantation forest fires. So, uh, so we've used those um, this year and in the past. So accessing those um, ground firefighting resources, is that done at all through the National Resource Sharing Centre that AFAC has, or is that an entirely, a, um, I, I guess, into company arrangement? It, it was, um, in the past, it has been just an intercompany arrangement, but um, this year we actually used the, the national resource sharing um, arrangements, um, which which actually, you know, um, brings it into much um, a better... Um, it, it, um, it's more, you know, fully coordinated with the whole system, and so it it, um, it actually makes it easier to get those resources through the system. Uh, do you have the same kind of visibility of those ground uh, firefighters uh, as you do through the arena system for your aerial firefighting capabilities? No, no. There's there is no national system that. Um, as qualifications for, for people, and that's one of the issues. It's been an issue over many years. Um, we really need a, a, a national qualification system and a, and a national um, database that uh, then just makes those skills transferable. I see. Um, you also spoke before about having special skills for those who uh, understand the fuel types in plantations as opposed to native forests. What's the kind of um, economic value at risk uh, with, with fires that ignite in or near uh, plantations? Our total estate is valued at $1.5 billion. Is that just in Victoria or is that including the uh, Queensland and New Zealand plantations? That's just in Victoria. And, and then associated with that is additional industry, um, you know, the, the other industries that we support. So, for instance, after the 2009 fires, there was 160 jobs that went in the Latrobe Valley when the Arahalt Harvey Mill closed in Morwell eight years after those fires because it had run out of resource. And what was the has there been an estimate given or, or or made of the of the economic loss from the fires that affected uh, the HVP plantations from the 2019-2020 bushfire season? I'm unaware of that at the moment. Right. The um, you, you deal also with in the submission in relation to in particular issues about cross border. Uh, experience. Um, the first thing I want to ask you about that is that from the actual personal experience of Q, of um, HVP, or is that from your your broader uh, knowledge and association with um, uh, aerial firefighting uh, over the years in your role as um, corporate fire manager? It is both, actually. From personal experience, I've um, 
I spent eight years working in the border region of the South Australian Victorian border, um, and I've seen um, the effects of, of um, poor coordination across borders as well. So, how how might um, well, what what are some of the issues that uh, you've identified in terms of cross border coordination, just generally? Uh, and in particular communication issues? It's one of the issues is the, the um, different systems used in, in different states. And um, we, we generally have a common fire ground channel that we can find um, on, the, um, on the state border, but the dispatch systems are completely separated out. So, um, you know, if I'm sitting 20 k's inside the the uh, Victorian border, I cannot, unless I've got yet another radio in my vehicle, I cannot hear what's happening in, in South Australia as far as any dispatch. And what about the use of radio systems? Is there, you've spoken particularly about having a, being able to identify a common channel, uh, but what about the coordination from the ground levels with the aerial assets when, there's, when you're seeking to defend the QVP? Sorry, withdraw that. The um, HPV <laughs> plantations. Yes, the, there's um, one of the things that we do come across is that in um, in the southwest of Victoria there is. Two aircraft that are based just over the border um, in Mount Gambier. They're only about um, 10 kilometres into South Australia. And unfortunately, because of the way the different systems of the states, um, they are allowed to respond within um, around about 25 kilometres, but they are not always responded uh, as the closest uh, aircraft to, to fires. Once once you get beyond that 25 kilometre area, then um, it's got to go through the state air desks in both states and that um, adds time to, to the, um, the takeoff. In considering um, how, how the, the Commission might consider issues concerning aerial firefighting and how they might be developed in the future, what, what kind of um, considerations from you, based on your own personal experience and your role as corporate fire manager, um, would have the greatest priority for um, focus and attention by the Commission? I'd certainly like to see the, um, the state borders dissolved effectively, for, especially for aerial support, so that, that the closest aircraft respond to every fire and, and you don't have those 25 kilometre um, natural borders. Um, and then, you know, it is all about that um, common training and common systems, common um, equipment, uh, so that effectively it dissolves those state borders and, and we, because we're fighting the one fire, we really need to be able to, to uh, fight it most effectively. Thanks very much, um, uh, Ms Ryan. I, Commissioners, I don't have any further questions. Perhaps you do. Just uh, a couple of quick questions, Ms Ryan, and thank you very much for the conciseness of, uh, of your statements today. It's, it's helped us a lot. Um, one question. HVP chooses to contract its own aerial assets. Uh, I could assume why that is, but can you just give us an understanding of why you've chosen to do that and not just rely on, on a state's uh, contracting? Yes, the, the state of Victoria actually has pretty good uh, aircraft and, and they're well um, resourced right across the state. Um, but during um, major campaigns, and especially where you have particularly one side of the state uh, might be um, under threat, and so there is a significant movement of um, the resources to to um, to that threat, and that often leads to our um, assets being exposed. And so, essentially, this is part of our insurance program to make sure that. Um, if there is a fire near our assets, then, then we've got something that we can respond with. 
thanks for that. And that wasn't a shot at a state. It was more interested in uh, you know, the commercial aspects of that. Uh, and, and one final question from me. Are you aware of any other plantation owners around Australia that, that do contract their own assets to protect their, their resources? I believe there are some, um, some plantation owners that do contract um, some aircraft, but I, I couldn't tell you any details of them. And, uh, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Commissioner Bennett? Um, no, just one quick question, though, in relation to that last one just asked. Are there other plantation owners of the same size as you? Yes, there are. Um, in New South Wales, the forestry for um, New South Wales is, is actually larger than us. Uh, in South Australia, 141 is um, slightly smaller than us. In Queensland, uh, HQ is uh, around about the same size, it's maybe a little bit bigger. Thank you very much. But you're not aware that they, whether or not they have their own um, aerial, aerial support? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Ms. Hagen-Doran, any further questions? Uh, no, not at this time. It's not from us. So, <laughs> okay. Just, we'll just check to see if there's been anything raised. No? No. Um, there, there has been one matter raised, not in relation to this witness, uh, and as a consequence, I'm proposing to take uh, the next witness out of order. Okay. Um, but I don't think there's any other further matters in those circumstances. Might Ms Ryan um, be excused? And Ms Ryan may be excused. And thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, Commissioners, just while we uh, rearrange the witness order, the, I'm proposing to call uh, Mr. Dr Clothier next. Um, if I could just deal with the tender of the two um, Australian government documents that have been notified to parties. Um, the first is um, TSB.501001001. which is a, uh, an Australian Transport Safety Bureau report uh, from called a safety analysis of aerial firefighting occurrences in Australia for the period July 2000 to March 2020. Operator, do you want me to give you that code again? TSB 501001001. I'll just uh, ask Mr Glover to assist me with the tab. 15. 15, I'm told. Uh, commissioners, this document, um, if we could go to page three, just that first paragraph. This is research that has been undertaken by the ATSB in response to a notice by the Royal Commission uh, which asked, in which they were asked to describe any key operational and safety challenges encountered in coordinating and responding to fires associated with the use of aircraft and aerial firefighting techniques. Um, and this report forms part of the Bureau's response to um, our notice. Uh, the Observation, if we could go on to the next, um, under the next heading, what the ATSB found, um, just noting the observation or the finding that aviation activity relating to aerial firefighting has increased over recent bushfire seasons. Um, the final sentence, estimates of aerial firefighting activity for the most recent bushfire season 2019-2020 have been around four times higher than any other recent bushfire seasons. And just at the bottom of the page, uh, the last paragraph, half of all reported aerial firefighting occurrences and four-fifths of more severe aerial firefighting occurrences were operational in nature, typically terrain collisions, with around one quarter over the page of the more severe occurrences associated with aircraft. Further, around one quarter of more severe occurrences involved a technical issue, most commonly engine failure or malfunction. In the last paragraph, additional risks to those inherent to low-level flying can be seen in higher occurrence rates compared to other low-level flying activities. Um, between 2014 and 2018, 
VH registered aerial firefighting aircraft had higher rates of communication related occurrences, flight preparation, navigation, operational occurrences, aircraft separation occurrences, operational non-compliance occurrences, airframe related technical issues and encounters with remotely piloted aircraft. Aerial firefighting had lower rates for terrain collision and aircraft control related occurrences. And there's then a more detailed um, analysis and I just wanted to bring one more matter to your attention which is on page uh, 006 which is the graph at figure one. This is um, aerial firefighting occurrences in Australia and figure one is a number of reported aerial firefighting occurrences per financial year and you can see that the ATSB has included in this um, the most recent fire season 2019-2020 and you can see the disparity as against earlier seasons. Um, the number of incidents, uh, number of serious incidents, the number of accidents and the fatal accidents. So not a just to keep that in context, we'll go back to the original statement that the activity has been four times higher than recent bushfire seasons. So we need to keep that uh, in but mind as well. But does also, table one help in that? Table, table one seems to be occurrences per hundred thousand hours. Does that give us a better? That's the normal measure. So the you know difficulty is to give a better measure than, than an absolute measure, rather to have the um, a proportional. Measure. So can I take you to that? That's on triple zero seven. This is table one, occurrence rates for VH registered aircraft conducting aerial work. This though is for the period 2014 to 2018 uh, and um, the extrapolation to the absolute numbers we saw in the previous one, I can't immediately assist you. Um, but put that, as, put as that into context, VH registered aircraft or Australian registered aircraft, so overseas contracted or support aircraft wouldn't be in that, that data. Uh, I don't the, believe. Thank you, Chair. Um, the last matter I just wanted to have noted, the last page, um, 25, about the ATSB, just to note, we haven't required their attendance, the report was of, of assistance to us. Um, it's an independent Commonwealth Government statutory agency uh, which is separate from transport regulators, policy makers and service providers um, and is responsible for investigating accidents and other transport safety matters involving civil aviation, marine and rail operations. The one matter, there was of course a fatal occurrence during the course of the 2019-2020 um, the bushfire season. Um, that is the subject of a separate report um, and a preliminary report has been given but that investigation is ongoing and given the terms of reference of this commission uh, we have not proposed to um, bring those matters to you. No, and it would, wouldn't be appropriate to do that. Thank you. Thank you. So I uh, tender that document um, as exhibit... I apologise, Chair, I've lost my exhibit list. Exhibit 4.2.15. Right. So that document we received as an exhibit as marked. And the other matter is the uh, AWS 500 001 0001, which is the response by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority to a notice to provide information uh, dated 3 April and responses 28 April 2020. Um, proposed to tender that and just draw your attention to two paragraphs on page three. Uh, that document will be exhibit 4.2.16. Okay, and I, I note that uh, we will probably be seeking more from CASA. Yes, just we'll, in that. But we will uh, take that document uh, as marked as an exhibit. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Just going to the paragraph commencing the duration and intensity of this fire season, which is about halfway down the page, led to a more complex airspace management system having to be implemented to facilitate aerial firefighting activities. This complexity was driven by the number of locations requiring an application of aerial fire retardant, the high number of aircraft in use, a number of which had not 
previously been used in Australia for aerial firefighting purposes and the need to allow significant numbers of these aircraft to operate in the same airspace at the same time. And this next part is the, we anticipate um, communicating further with CASA. Uh, CASA intends to have discussions with the relevant state and territory authorities and also with the Department of Defence with a view to developing more robust airspace management arrangements to support large scale sustained aerial firefighting operations. Um, these discussions will commence in earnest once the current pandemic restrictions allow. Uh, and the next paragraph, Commissioners, I'm to say something about that. Um, finally, CASA experienced a heavy regulatory services workload associated with priority assessment of applications for AOCs, which is an abbreviation for Air Operator Certificates, or variation to AOCs by firefighting operations seeking to bring aircraft into the country to assist in the firefighting effort. So this speaks to the issue of the international assistance that went to the NAF, um, NAFC, sorry, NAFC uh, coordination efforts. Um, I continue. A higher than usual number of these applications related to large complex transport category aircraft such as the Boeing 737 and the McDonnell Douglas DC-10. And again, this is a matter that we'll return to CASA with for their assistance. In CASA light, is currently light. assessing the lessons learned through this experience to determine whether there are more efficient means of assisting operators to bring aerial firefighting assets online swiftly to deal with bushfire emergencies. In context, I think the paragraph, um, the third major paragraph is also relevant um, in on the page. Um, As part of its role? It, well, the role is generally, it talks about the, the, uh, the uh, a role that is often was generally performed by an office from the relevant state or territory emergency management fire I'd service. So that also that comes in that precedes the the um, <coughs> passages you took us to, but I think is also possibly of puts it into context a little bit as well. Thank you, Commissioner Bennett. So I anticipate um, we, we note the limitations on um, uh, the timing for that that work. Uh, as is the position with a number of state and territory and Commonwealth agencies, but we'll, we'll um, uh, communicate further with CASA and seek their further assistance. Uh, commissioners, in those circumstances... Did I turn to that? Yes. Um, in those... The timing I now propose to call uh, Mr Rhys Clothier, who is the President of the Australian Association for Unmanned Systems. Mr Clothier, if I said your name correctly, I do apologise if I have not. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it's Doctor as well. And we've just lost him. Is he coming? It is. <laughs> Dr. Clothier, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Appreciate Sorry, it. Sorry, Dr. Clothier. Um, the, uh, I'll just have the volume turned up so that I can hear you. Uh, do you take an oath or affirmation? An affirmation. Be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Dr. Claudia, the, um, the Australian Association for Unmanned Systems, you're the president of that organisation. What is that organisation? So, the Australian Association for Unmanned Systems uh, represents 2,300 members uh, from across the unmanned aircraft systems community. It represents both small and large aircraft operators, as well as the original equipment manufacturers, uh, supporting contracting services, as well as um, technical and other sort of the, the ecosystem of the industry. So it's not just an operator um, uh, membership. Right. Um, unmanned systems, oftentimes referred to as drones, are they the same things or are they, is, is that an interchangeable term or is that, um, am I, misdescribing? So drones are probably more the more common vernacular for describing unmanned aircraft systems, which has a formal definition within the regulations, and remotely piloted aircraft systems is as defined in the Civil Aviation Safety Regulations. I see. Now, um, the association has prepared a response dated 22 May uh, to a notice issued by the Commission. Commissioners, that is document 4.3.1 at tab D of your bundle, I'm told. Um, can I just have that brought up? REC 500 001 0001. Now, Dr. Claudia, that should show on your screen. 
Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. And did you have a role in preparing this um, preparing this response? So this response reflects uh, the input from a number of expertise across our membership, and yes, I did, and I can speak to uh, components of it. All right. Um, the uh, primary matters that are addressed in your uh, uh, response is about the use of drones to assist in firefighting, uh, and and. First thing I wanted to get is to get a sense for the commissioners of how has that changed over recent time in Australia. So, we're only just beginning to scratch the surface on the potential for this technology in a broad range of uh, fire prevention, fire fighting, and fire recovery applications and missions. Uh, and not a lot has changed over the the last sort of ten years that I've been been following this. Uh, largely, the uh, introduction of the technology to this domain has been phased and starting with what we call low capability or small unmanned systems, mm -hmm. which is a, an entirely um, uh, you know, proportionate and, and um, logical way to approach this. But we are yet to, to really make that big step into bringing in sizable and more capable systems and exploring their potential use in the missions. So I asked you a question in relation to firefighting, but is a drones or unmanned systems able to be used in efforts in the sense, in a preparatory sense, before not just in terms of a response? Yes. So all phases in in bushfire preparation. So you could see them, and they have been used overseas to support uh, backburning efforts, from dropping incendiaries to to monitoring the actual backburning effort itself to uh, making sure that vegetation growth in, in um, sort of clearance ways um, uh, has been uh, managed and from fire load mapping to understand what the risk is. So there's a vast array of potential uh, mission sets in the pre or preparation um, to a fire season. Uh, now, uh, as I understand it, uh, NAFSI, that is the National Aerial Firefighting uh, Centre, is a member of the Australian Association of Unmanned Systems. Is that right? That's correct. And what, what dealings does the association have with NAFSI other than the one I've just identified? So NAFSI have been a very proactive um, and engaging uh, member, and we have engaged as industry with them as well. They've been very proactive in their conversations with the industry to better understand uh, the requirements of the technology and the potential for its use um, in firefighting. Uh, in 2015, AAUS in, had a joint conference with NAFSI, co-organised, which brought together the various agencies across the country to explore exactly that topic. Uh, and NAFSI has also invited uh, representatives from the AAOS executive to participate in meetings on their strategic committee at various times to, to share that information and understanding. Do you, are you aware of any proposal to incorporate um, the use of unmanned systems in the aerial firefighting uh, procurement that NAFSI oversees or facilitates? I'm not aware of any anything that NASA is, is currently planning. All right, um, and just in relation to the use of use of unmanned systems and and drones, um, the uh, in Australia, as I understand it, the uh, fire agencies have been purchasing and operating small and inexpensive drone systems. That that's how you put it in the in the response. Um, is there? Are you aware of any longer-term plan to incorporate um, uh, um, the use of drones uh, in a in a more substantive sense? Sorry, can you repeat the yeah. question? Just broke up right at the end, Council. Oh, Sorry. did I? I apologise. Um, my question was, uh, are you aware of any plans, you, you, sorry, you commenced at the beginning by identifying uh, the recent experience. Is there is there much prospect of there being uh, the incorporation of drones instead of, um, uh, instead of or in addition to in a much more prominent way in firefighting in Australia? Is there any movement? I'm trying to get a sense of that from you. Yeah, look, based on our prior engagement, both with the agencies and, and NAFSI and industry um, uh, demonstrations and trials with the agencies, 
we believe there is a genuine um, appreciation and, and willingness to explore that opportunity um, to exploit drones in a wide variety of, of potential missions. Um, to date, we, we have only seen limited uh, progress on that front, and, and we believe there's a, there's a number of reasons for that, as outlined in our submission. Um, but we do believe there's a genuine willingness. I'm unaware of any formal programs that may be, may be going to pursue that, um, but we definitely recognise the um, significant potential for that technology. So um, we have taken it out of order, so I'll just raise it in this way. As I um Drones can operate at night and they can operate um, in and around smoke cover. Is that some of the advantages that you understand them to have to deal with um, a more comprehensive firefighting, aerial firefighting capability? I think you hit the nail on the head there. Definitely more comprehensive. So drones would um, supplement and complement the current capability, not replace it, at least in the near to, near to middle term. Uh, so applications that are too dull, dirty and dangerous for manned aviation to perform, so low level flight, uh, night operations are great examples where it's just too dangerous to, to operate a conventional um, piloted aircraft. They would be niche areas for, for drones at the moment. But drones also offer performance capability above and beyond manned aircraft. So some uh, more capable aircraft that are a little bit larger operate um, at very high altitudes. They can stay aloft from 24 hours to 48 hours at a time mm -hmm. without the need to put any person at uh, potential risk and they can map and survey broad areas uh, in that time. So there are capability advantages in some areas. There are niche uh, opportunities or capabilities or roles they can fulfill. And in other ways, they can supplement um, manned aircraft, perhaps freeing up manned aircraft to as specialist assets perform more important missions. So there's, there are various ways in which drone can, drones can enhance the existing capability rather than replace it. Now, um, of course, one of the matters that is raised, uh, has been raised with the Commission, is a safety concern in relation to the use of drones and the risk of collision. Um, how is, is, is that a concern as you understand it? Yes, it's a very um, legitimate concern. There's usually a large number of manned aircraft in operation on a fire zone. It's, it's challenging conditions with smoke and wind and terrain. Um, it, putting all that aside, operating unmanned aircraft alongside other aviation is a challenge. Um, we have a safety case and approval process to, to mitigate and manage those risks, um, but that is a key area um, that needs to be addressed in order to see the more routine use of unmanned systems, not only in fire emissions, but more broadly in our community. So that takes me to the question I wanted to raise with you, which was um, the regulatory uh, regime that operates in Australia uh, um, in respect of the use of drones, just use of drones generally. Um, I, I understand there are uh, CASA safety rules. Uh, what are those that apply to drones and how do they restrict the use or regulate the use? So the relevant regulations are largely contained in Civil Aviation Safety Regulation 1998, Part 101. Um, and in those regulations, uh, firstly, they're world leading. So no one has solved this around the world. CASA is seen as a world leader in the regulation of the sector, but we still have a way to go before we, we see a uh, framework that enables routine, regular use of unmanned aircraft in non-segregated airspace. Um, so with, with that in context, the, the regulatory framework that's been developed is, is flexible and has enabled uh, the industry to develop safely, uh, but it's an, based on a case-by-case -case approval process if you want to do anything complex like, uh, say, perform a beyond visual line of sight mission. And to achieve uh, or to gain approval, uh, an oper operator must submit a detailed safety case to the regulator along with um, supporting operations procedures and manuals. Um, and that is reviewed by CASA and if, um, if approved, the operator will be approved for a specific location and a specific time um, to undertake those missions. So there are time limited, um, geo geographically limited approval. And that's one of the biggest challenges to uh, more routine use of unmanned systems in support of fire missions is that to get that approval, it takes uh, a matter of days to weeks, depending on how, how complex the airspace and complex the environment. And um, by then the fire has probably already moved on and passed. So it's a very difficult um, uh, timeline to meet. Um, the other matter I wanted to raise was, are there other requirements across the country 
You speak in the submission to a, a patchwork of requirements. I take it there are state and regulatory and, and local government requirements uh, that deal with the use of unmanned... Um, that do use, deal with the risk uh, associated with uh, un, use of unmanned uh, aircraft. Yeah, so the Civil Aviation Safety Authority is the only authority um, responsible for the safety of aviation. The, the bylaws, the local government laws that you're referring to, mainly uh, relate to um, the operation on, on or in um, the local government area or in a national park or state forest, and they have specific, uh, shall we say, bylaws that apply to the operation of aircraft. They vary between um, jurisdiction and, and land authority. Uh, and often um, they attempt to apply to aircraft that are just overflying as well. Oh. So what we end up with for, for most operators is a patchwork of applicable regulations that they must um, go out and identify and then, and then seek approval against. Uh, they're not necessarily related to aviation safety. I see. Right. Um, just bear with me one moment, um, Mr. Dr. Colvin, I should say. Uh, Just one, one matter I want to clarify with you. You said a moment ago about um, authorisation of operations beyond visual line of sight. What does, what, what, what's that refer to? So one of the key operational restrictions on, on the use of drones or RPAS is to keep them within line of sight, so visual line of sight, unaided of the remote pilot who's in command or control of that aircraft. To go beyond that visual range, you need to apply or seek approval from CASA to do so, and the mechanism is, is an area approval. Um, and, that and that enables you to, to basically fly to the range of, of your communications link, as opposed to the visual line of sight of the pilot on the ground. I see. All right. Um, commissioners, I might just tender um, these uh, associations' response, which I don't think I've done, or did I do? Did I do it? Should I attend to that? Yeah, I thought you didn't do that all this morning. No. Okay. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll I can always confirm it tomorrow. Um, Dr Clothier, I don't have any further questions for you, if I might just confirm with the Commissioners. Dr Clothier, a couple of questions uh, for you. And uh, you, you gave the broad capability that uh, ARPAS can, uh, can do. Can you just comment please on one particular area, it comes up in all the community submissions, it's come up in the public submissions, about the, the loss of communications, uh, not just for the for the public but also for the firefighters out there. Do RPAS have the capability for communication relay or packages? You know, that, I know that you talked about persistence before, about the ability to sit over the, the, the fires. Do, does that capability exist today out there or would it be something that would need to be developed? Uh, most definitely so, and it has been trialled in Australia previously as well for a tactical relay, uh, communications relay system to support um, assets, fire assets on the ground. It was demonstrated using a UAS. Uh, more broadly, we have um, aircraft that are not uh, yet available uh, for, say, um, sale or lease, but are under development that can provide essentially a um, cell tower in the sky. So you could fly it over an area that has been stricken um, by a fire and that lacks uh, communications infrastructure and instantly provide um, communications infrastructure to the, public's, the public and ag responding agencies as well. Thank you for that. that. That's one of the themes about emerging technologies that are there to solve some, uh, some complex issues. One other question for you. You, you talked about the, the major issue. There's a few major issues at the moment, but it seems like uh, one of the issues is if an RPAS is there, we work separation through segregation rather than integration with other assets that uh, might be fighting the fire at the time. To your knowledge, are there any systems out there that would allow the situational awareness for, uh, for other aircraft that are airborne to be able to integrate an RPAS into that, uh, provide situational awareness to integrate an RPAS into that, uh, that particular aerial firefighting uh, activity? Uh, so you wouldn't have to rely on segregation? Uh, the short answer is yes, they're under development, but uh, standards for their certification and approval uh, have yet to be um, developed. And there's multiple ways in which um, 
you can provide that situational awareness using a variety of non-cooperative sensors, so things like radar, electro-optical systems and the like, and cooperative systems or transponder-based systems or network comms systems that enable aircraft to exchange information and therefore for pilots to know where the uh, different aircraft are and, and plan accordingly. Um, so there are a, a layered uh, suite of technologies that uh, industry is pursuing, but the regulatory pathway to approve those anywhere in the world has, has yet to be established. Okay, so a similar system like an ADSB-based system or something along those lines, but would require all ADS the aircraft yep. to have that, those systems on board? Yeah. Correct. Equip, equipage of all uh, participating aircraft is, is uh, necessary. Okay, thank you for that. Commissioner Bennett? Thank you. I just have a couple. Um, you, you've raised the whole issue about the um, getting cars for approval and you've said that everyone's trying their best to, to do it and that it's world leading. I guess I wanted to get an under... You said it was on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, what are the differences between the approval for an unmanned uh, aircraft and, and all the multiplicity of, of the manned aircraft that have to come on in this space? Is there a time difference so far as you're aware in the approval process? And or do you know whether they also have to go through it on a case-by-case -case basis? If you don't know, don't say. But I was just wondering if you could give me an idea of the time differentials, if there is one, relevantly. <laughs> I can't give you a uh, definitive answer on the time differentials, um, but I can on relation to unmanned systems if, if there is interest. Yeah, well, how long? I mean, well, you've already said it takes time and it's on a case by case basis, and sometimes that is just too long for the emergency. So I don't think we need to go into the detail of that. I only had one other quick question. Um, you were talking about uh, the fact that there are other regulations in various parts of the country for um, what I'll call drones or unmanned aircraft. Are you aware of if any of them, any of those regulations provide for exceptions in, in emergencies? Are you personally aware from your looking at them? No, no, and they wouldn't apply to the safety of flight uh, itself. No, but where it's not for safety, well, I suppose some of them, I suppose they're all directly or indirectly, so far as you're aware, are they all for safety reasons? No. So some of them would be for disturbance of animals or keeping the peace or privacy or noise. There'll be a, a number of reasons as to, to why they're in place by the local government or land authorities. But I'm unaware of any of them that have dispensations or exclusions on the basis of civil or um, emergency situations. Thank you very much. That was all. Thank you. Commissioner McIntosh. None. None from me, thanks, Chair, other than to say thank you, Doctor, for your evidence. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Ms Hogan-Dorn? Uh, there is nothing further, but I didn't tender the exhibit, so I'm going to... We should do that now. May, uh, the exhibit uh, 4.3.1. We'll accept that exhibit as marked. Thank you. Uh, and might Dr Clothier be excused? Dr Clothier, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. You're excused. Thank, thank you. you. Commissioners, the final, um, the final segment of today is a panel uh, which um, uh, consists of uh, Mr Philip Hurst, Mr John McDermott and Mr Raymond Cronin. Uh, if they might be called. Mr Cronin represents an organisation too, doesn't he? Mr. Mr. McDermott, Mr. Hurst, Mr. Cronin, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. We're just waiting for the video conferencing to stabilise. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, I'll, I'll ask each of you in turn to uh, whether you wish to take an oath or affirmation, uh, and then I'll um, then I'll. Uh, Take each of you in turn. Mr. McDermott, will you take an oath or affirmation? Affirmation's fine. Mr. McDermott, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. 
Mr Hurst, will you take an oath or affirmation? Yeah. Affirmation, thanks. Mr Hurst, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Mr Cronin, will you take an oath or affirmation? Affirmation. Mr Cronin, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Cronin, I'll just check your audio levels. Um, Mr Cronin, you're the uh, Managing Director of Kestrel, Crestal, Kestrel Aviation, is that correct? That is correct, Councillor. Just see if we can get you any louder. It's a little difficult to hear you. Uh, okay. Mr. Cronin, I understand I'd like you. To give this account. Could you try that again, Mr. Cronin? Just, uh, just checking on the one. Yeah, Mr. Cronin. Uh, uh, I'll come back to you in just a moment. We just check the levels um, in the uh, through the, the uh, technology facilitators. Uh, Mr. Hurst, you're the um, CEO of the Aerial Application Association of Australia. Correct. Um, the four A's, is the, as it's, as it's oft, often known, is the national industry body representing Australia's aerial firefighting operators and pilots. Is that right? Correct. Uh, how big is that association and, and what is its um, uh, purpose? Uh, the association is constituted by both uh, business operators and individual pilots, as well as associates and trade members. Uh, from an industry operator point of view, we uh, cover approximately 90 members, uh, which constitutes uh, probably over 90% of all aerial application, which includes agriculture as well as uh, firefighting uh, in fixed wing aircraft. And of course, we also have members who are uh, rotary wing uh, members as well. And we cover all of the rotary wing members who conduct aerial application uh, in agriculture and many of the ones who also do in firefighting. Uh, the objectives of the association, it's a non-for-profit association run by a board of directors drawn from the individual states and territories. And the objective of the association is to establish a uh, a system of uh, increasing professionalism and uh, environmental and economic sustainability uh, across the operations of our members. And are the members all domestic operators in Australia? Uh, domestic operators, or does it include international operators? Uh, from an operator point of view, they're all Australian domestic operators only. I see. Uh, and um, you also, I, I, I believe, also include pilots. Are they all dom also domestic pilots? Uh, yes, they are, uh, although we have a, a, a significant number of pilots who work in Australia from New Zealand uh, and also from the US and Canada, depending on the time of the season and the particular task. I should also mention some of our operators are also involved in international operations. Um, even though they're Australian operators, they also export uh, their services to various countries around the world on uh, firefighting and other services. One of the questions I asked um uh, Mr Alder of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre was whether or not in the procurement strategy uh, for aerial firefighting in Australia there was a, to call it colloquially, buy Australia first um, policy. Uh, is that a, a, a policy that's been advocated by the um, four A's? Uh, yes, it has. We've uh, been involved in advocating uh, an Australia first policy since about 2003. Uh, when there was a significant uh, inquiry after the 2002 three fires. Uh, we've been quite consistent in our policy position across that time, up to as recently as the release of a joint policy between ourselves and the Australian Helicopter Industry Association, uh, which clearly again reiterated uh, our view that there should be a Buy Australia First policy through a national partnership between government and industry. And, and what 
how does how does an how does a policy like that is it intended to work? Well, the starting point for us was to establish a partnership where we could have those sorts of discussions. Um, we're at very early stages with our consultative work with the fire agencies and NAFSI and AFAC. Uh, but we have had a very positive start with a couple of meetings with the key strategic group of the agencies over the um, uh, probably the last uh, 12 months. Um, we were meant to have an aerial firefighting forum last year. But unfortunately, it had to be uh, deferred, uh, delayed because of the early onset of the fire season. So we were hoping to be in uh, a much stronger consultative position, uh, I think is the safest way to put it, so that we could advance those sorts of ideas that we had had about a, um, a national partnership. What's the thinking behind the policy? What's it seeking to achieve other than the obvious commercial advancement of domestic um, uh, uh, members of your association? Uh, simply the capacity to put fires out in the most effective means possible. And by that, we wanted to have a, uh, a joint partnership. We'd been through a process of dealing with uh, some agencies, particularly New South Wales, where we had thought that having an Australian uh, capability did a, a bunch of good services for the community, uh, including things like uh, allowing the agencies and NAFSI to better understand some of the shortcomings of their current policies. For example, the very short length of contracts, just as one example. Um, we had to establish the systems to have a dialogue first, and we just hadn't got to the stage of having uh, the dialogue other than in very general terms. Uh, Mr Cronin, you're the president uh, of the Australian Helicopter Industry Association, in addition to your role as managing director of Kestrel Aviation, that's right? That's correct, Councillor. And and what's the Australian Helicopter Industry Association? Uh, what? Sorry, it's, it's what it's what is. What what are the nature of the membership uh, and the size and scope of the um, activities of the association? Okay, the association uh, uh, spans the the whole uh, broad width of a bandwidth of the industry from offshore through to all the agricultural activities such as mustering, uh, firefighting. So it's a very broad coverage. Um, the membership is made up of uh, principally operators and individuals. Um, With the um, Helicopter Association, does it, its members also um, are procured their services are also procured through the, the NAFS, NAFSI uh, procurement process? A absolutely. The, 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 there are a large number of helicopter operators from one man uh, mar power operations right through to large uh, companies. Um, they all make up that uh, both the primary contracted fleet and the surge uh, fleet uh, to, for that surge capacity when we have uh, big years, so they can participate at various levels. One of the matters that Mr Hurst just mentioned was the length of the contracts that are offered through the NAFSI uh, procurement process. Is that an, a challenge that's been identified for helicopter operators as well? Absolutely. We, the, um, the helicopter industry supplies a very high capital uh, valued item. Uh, and whether you're a small operator or a very large operator, it doesn't change. The capital involved is, is very large. Having very short-term contracts is a demotivator. Um, it's not only just the, the primary airframe, it's all the roll equipment that you need to put on to be compliant with the NAFSI standards. So the current tenure, yes, we say is too short. Uh, it could be a little bit longer to be uh, a, a, a bit more attractive for people, the industry to invest. Mm -hmm. um, what's the, um, what's the, oh, sorry, just, just one moment. The, um, what kind of input does, and I'll come to both you and Mr Hurst, what kind of input does the Helicopter Association and in turn the Aerial Application Association have to the activities of NAFSI and its policy development? Well, the, uh, 
I think I'll re um, agree with Phil that we are really just in the infancy of uh, trying to develop a, a, a national policy and a, a better consultation process with NAFSI. Um, the uh, structure of NAFSI is, and its member agencies uh, tends to dictate that there are some independence there and there's struggles. Some people want to participate and others don't. Um, we would like, as uh, Phil has alluded to, uh, strengthen that relationship so that the communities of Australia can actually benefit from the two peak bodies uh, and get the best of both of those bodies and the input that we have to offer. Um, uh, Mr Hurst said, I think, uh, is NAFSI a member of either of your industry associations or is there any other, is there any kind of formal connection between the two industry associations? Perhaps, Mr Hurst, you might uh, respond first. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. Um, in terms of a formal relationship between industry and NAFSI, uh, and I'm having to focus under advisement from the AHIA, uh, there's no formal arrangement and uh, never has been. Uh, certainly they're not members of ours. Uh, we have uh, tried to broker discussions over many years and we've succeeded in doing that on an informal basis uh, and a, uh, a fairly uh, uh, irregular basis. Um, and we had hoped that the ground that we'd made last year in, in finally getting uh, a bit more consultation happening at a high level uh, was extremely welcome and an extremely positive development. And we think we can still build on that uh, very much uh, before the next fire season. I might just now go to Mr McDermott. Mr McDermott, um, you are the President of McDermott Aviation. Could you just uh, describe to the Commissioners what's the scope of McDermott Aviation and what are its activities in Australia and I believe internationally? Correct. Uh, uh, McDermott Aviation, we're members of the Four A's and the Helicopter Association. And uh, we provide, uh, we started out as an aerial application business, so hence aerial firefighting is a part of aerial application. So we provide uh, specialist helicopters uh, throughout the states via NAFSI, but sometimes on a state basis. Mm -hmm. uh, we were part of the original NAFSI uh, fleet that was set up in 2003. Uh, NAFSI had a meeting uh, with us to say, that, um, uh, to say that there was an appetite for the government to invest to help local operators build a fleet of specialist helicopters normally not be available within Australia for aerial firefighting. And uh, we'd already begun that task indirectly through our aerial application of some forestry. So we were, in fact, we were the very first recipient of a NAFSI firefighting contract for helicopters. Um, and we've held NAFSI contracts basically on and off since. Um, and we currently have three in Australia. We supply special firefighting uh, capability to Indonesia, generally, um, New Caledonia. From time, we're invited to America and Canada if, if they have fire seasons got a fairly good uh, breadth, width of um, experience uh, throughout this industry and we've been fairly um, uh, active in developing for aerial firefighting to and uh, cancel agencies and good means of, of making our industry effective and efficient. You, you mentioned uh, the number of contracts and something procurement uh, all through NAFSI. And Mr. Hurst have both made to the contract NAFSI. Is that presented for McDermott Aviation? Look, um, we all 
for the same fate of investment. I think current year with one more year, year option. Yeah. I believe where we down in Australia, the contract period per year is too short. So traditionally, we would get four day contracts in South Wales, West Tasmania. There's often the period for a week or two, weeks, four days, where they and then if reasons an extended contract, then we'll extend for two weeks. Um, Is somewhere between 20 days per season. This is a, um, a, it allows us to get value for money for the and um, to build on it, which is substantial. As an operator, really long periods of If you don't, you're locked out from off and to the term of the contracts actually more attractive for some of the larger uh, to maybe in Australia. Uh, We about this last in no, uh, 2000 uh, for a total of an hours out in on fires. Participate in site flood and other natural disasters that are out. So, if, uh, to be honest, uh, and then take the money and go, And I might as see the same American in case. Uh, engaged on the fire activities. So that's what we deal with, I guess, as, as competition. So it possibly sounds like a sour grape job. It's not meant to be, but it is the reality with what we deal with and what we've got to do and, and we've got to look at for the broader picture going forward. Now, Sorry if I was too long. <laughs> Miss, I've, I've asked each of you in relation to procurement issues. What I wanted to ask now was in relation to the operational side of aerial firefighting in particular, and perhaps um, if I could go to you, Mr. Cronin, um, the uh, the arena system we've had some evidence about this morning, and um, what I particularly wanted to ask some questions about was what's your impression of um, the operations and task deployment procedures as it, as between the different state and territory jurisdictions in Australia, and how they might be improved. Yes, Councillor, I think this um, arena is a good uh, harbour for information of, of what capability uh, is available uh, in, in any region, in any state, and uh, 
you know, the agencies have the capability of basically using it as a radar where they put in the fire location and it sends out a signal that says what's the closest availability, what's the and, and they may put in there a different type of capability, what role equipment they want, and that helps them to dispatch an aircraft very quickly. Um, well, in time, well, sometimes quickly, sometimes not. You know, really, if Arena's working with a call when needed fleet, which is a non-contracted aircraft that's sitting there, but the operators put their hand up, said, look, we're available, this is how long it will take us to push it out the shed and have it ready. Uh, it could be 15 minutes, or it could be four hours, or it could be two days. Um, so there's no guarantee with that process. The other process is a fully contracted, fully capable uh, aircraft fleet. Um, it could be numerous aircraft uh, under the NAFSI and the agency's uh, umbrella. Uh, and we talked about the predetermined dispatch, the PDD. Uh, that's the gold plate of process. You know, the, that's where a pilot will get a page uh, he's designated a region, he has a, a geographical footprint, and he knows that he has to respond to a fire within that area uh, and as soon as that page goes off. So that puts the aircraft in the air um, contracted. It's a requirement to be in the air by under 15 minutes. Typically, it'll be somewhere around the seven or eight minutes. Um, and I think the season averages have indicated that over the previous years of, for the states that are using PDD. There's absolutely no doubt that a fully capable service that sits there on standby beats any other process. One of the matters, Mr Hurst, that, you raise, um, that you've raised with the Commission is uh, what is described as um, tow trucking. Uh, and um, Mr McDermott has assisted the Commission by describing a, a, an alternative um, model for um, the coordination of aerial... Uh, assets in firefighting is a wolf pack model and Mr Cronin, I think you've used a similar concept but a sort of a swarming concept. Mr Hurst, could you just speak to that and, and identify how that might improve, at least to your you or your members' understanding, the response to f um, bushfires or other natural disasters in Australia? Yeah, certainly. Uh, the concept of tow tracking is simply pre-positioning at no charge to any agency in the hope of getting a contract. Or, sorry, in the hope of getting tasked onto a particular job. So you move the aircraft, whether it be fixed wing or rotary, closer to the fire seat in the hope that you'll get uh, the scraps of whatever's lying around. The simplest and most effective way to deal with that issue is to have aircraft available on full contract with predetermined dispatch uh, so that you can get them onto the fire in an aggressive initial attack role. Aggressive initial attack is where aircraft absolutely shine. It's where they do their best work when the fire is small and buys time for the ground crews to get in, as well as sometimes being able to uh, get the fire out at least in some significant way for the ground crews to do a better job. Um, so the issue of tow tracking really is a side effect of, for whatever reason, not having enough resources to ensure that there are fully available, fully contracted aircraft uh, on standby, ready to go. And as we've said in our various submissions, predetermined uh, dispatch is best practice. It's best practice around the world, uh, not only in Australia. And we really see that as being an opportunity for significantly improving the role of aircraft. Uh, there is a, an adjunct to this discussion, and that is on uh, some campaign fires. And in fact, almost every fire that runs over a number of days uh, the agencies need to struggle to get aircraft onto the fire before 10 to 11 Oh, just one moment. Staff, it may be due to reappraising the fire attack plan. It may be due to a lot of other issues. But the outcome is all of those hours in the early morning from dawn until 10 o'clock are wasted. Uh, they can often represent the best time to be attacking a fire, particularly on a campaign fire. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any great obvious reason as to why we simply don't get tasked onto fires a lot earlier, particularly on the multi-day ones. So if you were to put those together, predetermined uh, dispatch for fully contracted aircraft and get them onto the fires as early in the day as possible, we would be able to lift the productivity of the fleet quite considerably without any significant change in, um, uh, in expenditure.
Mr McDermott, I saw you nodding um, in relation to Mr Hurst's comments just then. Um, is that your... Um, uh, I take it you're in agreement with what Mr Hurst was saying? Yeah, that's correct, Councillor. Yeah. It's very frustrating. Can I, can I just ask one question? Yes. Uh, Mr McDermott, you actually made that as a comment in your um, submission that I noted when you were asked if there were any challenges encountered with it any delays in deploying aircraft during the 2019-2020 bushfires. You said at page six of your, um, of your response, we are, we are consistently tasked to fires too late and miss the opportunity for hard initial attack. Is, did you actually experience that in the last round of fires? I mean, in, I'm assuming this is what we're talking about now. Did you actually experience that uh, in the... Yeah, for sure. Um, Watching a fire develop when you're sitting with a helicopter ready to go and attack it is a very frustrating exercise. Um, we're obviously not allowed to go and attack the fire until we're directed to attack it. Um, and yet we see them start off uh, quite early on um, or, or develop. So for example, we may have a, a fire reasonably under control um, come, come dusk in the evening so the fire burns down to quite a low level and next morning it's the, the guys on the ground have been out and they've uh, they've taken it further under control and there are plenty of times where the fires build up in intensity as the day goes on and whereas we'd have a good chance of getting out there and hitting the fire reasonably hard and having a big impact it's not often until there's a wind change or for reasons we don't know that we're called in and by that stage often the fire's already off and running and it's it's a bigger problem to everybody just in respect to that if um might indicate who might best respond but is 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 this a consequence of the way in which of of the the way the you are contracted to provide these services or is it a way in which the man the the dispatch of your um, your aerial assets is managed? If I can just say, we do PD, predetermined dispatch in Victoria, um, and we do it in Western Australia, and some degree now we're starting to do it in Tasmania. It's very, very, very effective. Um, there are other states that don't use it, um, so therefore you've actually got to wait for somebody to make the call for us to go onto the fire ground. And there's often long periods of inaction, as it would appear to us to be inaction for us being called to the fire ground. I'll ask a question of you all, um, conscious of the time. How, how could national coordination of aerial firefighting be improved in Australia? So you've each spoken about operating in particular jurisdictions or your members have operated in particular jurisdictions. You've spoken to the... Um, the extent you've had any dealings with um, NAFSI and uh, um, uh, and the fire agencies at state and territory level. Um, Mr Hurst, I think you've addressed some of these matters uh, in the uh, assistance that's been provided by the Association to the Commission. Um, what's the uh, some of the matters that you uh, see can be done? I think for us in the uh, in an overarching view, the issue is the lack of systems. Uh, and that's a problem across pretty much all jurisdictions. So that we see that there is, uh, for example, no national safety management system. There is no system of continuous improvement. There's no system of quality assurance, incident reporting, or feedback to pilots, which are subsets of quality assurance, of course. So. It's a very long-winded question in the sense that it takes a long time to answer that, but it's really about the lack of a systemic approach uh, to addressing these issues. And I think if we had the systems in place over time, we'd be able to ratchet up uh, how we respond to particular problems we've identified. At the moment, we simply don't have the tools, and it's a little bit like the consultation uh, model we were talking about earlier. We're at very early days of getting these, despite having given very similar evidence in our 2003 uh, House of Representatives inquiry, which produced the NAN report, uh, which saw the birth of NAFSI. Uh, we're still labouring under this lack of overarching national systems 
that would actually help us improve over time. And whether that's in training or whether it's in dispatch or even for that matter procurement, uh, doesn't really matter. The issue is we don't have the systems in place and that's why we, another reason why we put them in our national uh, policy that uh, is available on our website, that was a free plug. Um, so in, in short, that's the best answer I can give. It's about the systems and if we had better systems in place, we could probably fix a lot of the difficulties that we have identified. I don't want to get down into the weeds because there are so many areas that we could improve but the fundamental problem is we don't have a system or we don't have the tools to actually do those improvements on a national basis. Uh, I've joined the chorus with the other two gentlemen uh, uh, appearing here today and suggesting that uh, making sure that we uh, dispatch aircraft, predetermined dispatch and in a swarm uh, or a wolf pack, whatever you want to call it, that may be a role that NAFSI could play in the future because NAFSI has largely no role in dispatch. Uh, NAFSI is largely a broker, a contract broker on behalf of the states and territories. The states and territories have full control of dispatch. So I think there's some areas in there where we could do some really good work to improve the outcomes and that's what we're interested in. As uh, Mr McDermott had said, I, I can't imagine anything more frustrating than watching a fire get bigger and bigger while you're sitting on the ground waiting for dispatch. Commissioners, I don't have any further at this time. Uh, we, of course, will explore some of the cross-border and the national standards issues uh, in further hearings uh, but when, and seek the um, input and response of the Commonwealth and State and Territory uh, organisa uh, agencies. Thank you, Councillor. I, I, just one question for Mr The Hurst, and I was just trying to dig through his submission there. And just to, you know, trying to stop this being Groundhog Day and looking at a systemic approach, you talked about a centre of excellence, I think, somewhere in your, your sub submission there. If, if there was something like that to set up as an advisory group to try and develop this better, where would that best be placed, do you think? We think it's absolutely critical that a centre for excellence be firmly based in industry. Uh, we think industry has the expertise. We think with uh, some support and funding, industry would be able to put uh, some very good support into this area. Uh, we have a good model with the uh, two associations working together. Uh, so we certainly see it uh, as an industry-driven uh, uh, initiative, uh, hopefully strongly supported by government and partnership with NAFSI slash AFAC. We think that could make a real difference in developing these uh, strategies and particularly around systems uh, because of course they have to um, they have to operate in such a way that all of the states and territories can participate i think the, the reason we put so much weight on this is that it is very difficult for any entity to resist a better practice than what they're currently doing and i think our, one of our many problems one of our problems has been the lack of a clear identification of what in fact is either best practice or for that matter, just better practice. Uh, we see bits of really good work going on in different states. We think it'd be almost irresistible if we had such a thing as a centre for excellence to identify what is in fact best and better practice to have that adopted. No, thank you for that. I appreciate uh, that, that answer. Thank you. Commissioners, Akatosh, Bennett. No. There's nothing further from me at this stage and we haven't had any communication from any of the parties. I'm not proposing to tender those materials at this stage that are the submissions and the responses okay. uh, pending further um, uh, confirmation from uh, interested state parties. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, then um, if Mr McDermott, Mr Hurst and Mr Cronin might be, um, uh, be excused. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I appreciate that. And uh, you are all excused. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, commissioners, so that's, that's it for the uh, evidence today. I indicate that uh, it's proposed that the, um, uh, the proceedings would adjourn until 9am tomorrow when uh, there will be a directions hearing for parties with leave to appear and we'll test the, proposing to test the facilities, uh, the, the technological facilities. Um, and an update will be published on the website as to when in the day the public hearing will resume. Um, it's anticipated it will be in the afternoon tomorrow, but that will be published on the website. Okay, we're adjourned and uh, we'll resume tomorrow morning at uh, nine o'clock. Thank you. All rise.